Hello and welcome to the world premiere of the 2022 Global Energy Healing Summit. I'm your host, Tom McCarthy, and I'm so incredibly grateful to be here with you today. This is such an awesome summit. And I, along with my co-hosts, Master Chun-Yi Lin and Jason Prawl, would like to take a moment to thank all the staff members, those people behind the scenes, plus our gifted speakers you've been learning from. And most of all, we want to thank our summit sponsors. Please be sure to check them out with the links that are given in the videos and make sure you do it because they help make this incredible event possible for you. So if you can, support our sponsors. I have been looking forward to this interview for so long. I, I really am excited about this interview today because I just actually met not in person, but over video, our next guest, but I heard about him several years ago. And I've always been so intrigued by him and the amazing work that he does. And so I'm excited for myself because I get to ask some questions and learn from this incredible gentleman. But I'm also so excited for all of you that are gonna to get to watch this and, and learn from him. His name is Raymond Grace. And he is the president and founder of the Raymond Grace Foundation. His work is truly amazing, and we'll jump into it a little bit later. He does so many good things for people all over the planet. I think uh, last count, and Raymond, you told me, but it's, it's probably more than this. You've reached people in 142 different countries, which I didn't even know there was that many on the planet. So that is, that is so amazing. He's written a couple books, uh, The Future is Yours, Do Something About It, which I am reading right now and I absolutely love it. And then he wrote a book about raising children and his daughter April is, is a big t uh, subject of that book. And then um, 70 DVDs, 70 DVDs he's produced with the teachings of what he's learned over the past 48 years. His work is being used all over the world for self-improvement, but also a big passion of his is water, which most of the planet is covered with water. As human beings, we're mostly water. So Raymond, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. I, I, I wasn't exaggerating. I really am so excited about this interview. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the invitation. I really, uh, really appreciate that. And uh, you go ahead and start off wherever you like, and I'll do my best to follow you. Yeah, and I love it. You're so down to earth, and and uh, this is what I love so much about you. You are you're the real deal. Uh, I want to start with because I I told you just uh, a minute or two ago I was speaking to a corporate group yesterday, a corporation, and one of the things I did right at the very beginning of my talk was I put a picture of you up, and everybody can see you now in your in your in your nice hat and. And uh, they can't see you though with uh, you know the full jeans and everything, but the way you dress. And and I said I asked the group. I said, "What profession do you think uh, this gentleman's in?" He's somebody that I'm just starting to get to know. I really admire him. And people said, you know, cowboy, rancher, which you know you do live on a big acreage, but you are a master energy worker. And how the heck you live in uh, Appalachia? on a couple hundred acres i'm sure not highly populated area where you where you live uh and i know your brother's in the studio there with you too but growing up how did you how did you how did you come to this work i'm so curious about that well i believe i can answer that i remember one day i was sitting in algebra class <laughs> and the teacher mentioned a fellow name of einstein which i had heard the name but knew absolutely nothing about and he said um, he used only a small portion, perhaps 25% of his, no, 10% of his brain maybe. I forget exactly how it was quoted, but uh, the studies had been, uh, done on his brain showed that he used a very small uh, part of it. And I'm thinking, I wonder what he could have done if he had used 25% of his brain. So I thought, I, I'll find out. So I set a goal that day to find out what could be done with the brain or with the mind. And I, it was slow going at first. And uh, I would read everything that I could get my hands on about unusual happenings, things that were not explainable. And then 
Well, time goes on. Uh, I took a class uh, called Silva, S-I-L-V-A, Silver Mind Control. Oh. And that helped me to realize uh, that I could change things with my thoughts. I always thought I could, but I didn't really understand the procedure for it. So that gave me a background to start out doing this. Well, I, always, I was a construction worker at the time, and uh, I learned a, a simple healing technique. <clears throat> I did not learn everything the class had to offer, but I got some things. So uh, I learned a simple healing technique. I went in to work on the job uh, on Monday morning, and the superintendent says, do you have anything for a headache? And I think, oh boy, I got a victim here to work <laughs> on. <laughs> Put up to his forehead, and I did something in my mind, and all at once he started backing away from me. And he said, it doesn't hurt anymore. Well, he didn't know it, but it scared me more than it did him. So I said, you know, this stuff works. So I, the reputation spread rather quickly because construction workers are always getting hurt. And I started working on people. And then they started taking me home with them to meet their family and work on them. And I started working on things I didn't even know how to pronounce and people were getting well. And I really didn't understand all this, but time went on and uh, I would continue to do work like that. A few of the uh, neighbors would get me to work on their kids or something. And I had very good results. Not perfect, no, but, but good results uh, helping people. Um, and I also got involved in shamanism. So I learned a little bit about uh, how, to, how the uh, Native American medicine people did things, became friends with a couple of them and learned from them. And then and, uh, go, moved on up to about 93, I got involved in uh, dowsing. So what I did, I took the best of all three philosophies and put it all together and, and simplified it. Now, you were talking about me being down to earth. The way I say it is watermelon is the biggest word I know. <laughs> so uh, I keep everything real simple. And uh, I don't use any big words, complicated phrases. I just uh, get it done. And uh, today I was doing sessions in Europe. Uh, uh, the day it was in Australia, uh, I worked with Skype uh, from or Zoom, either one from various places, as long as they can speak my brand of English. Uh, and I just work with people wherever they, they are and wherever they want help. Uh, I do that. I still run a small farm. Uh, I've got over 350 acres, uh, that, but most of it was trees. So uh, it's really not a matter of plowing up a lot of ground. Uh, but as time went on, I kept learning more and more about what we could do. And then, now that brings me up to, uh, I won't give all the details, but I met an older couple who lived in the back country of Northern Alberta. And I probably learned more about energy from those people than I learned from anybody else. Now, whenever you read the book, Future Showers are in chapter eight, yeah. Bill and Winnie, devoted up chapter in the book to them because I had learned so much from them. And uh, Bill taught me how to measure energy. Now, what we don't have is technical scientific terms for what we're measuring. We just call it energy. So uh, as to what scale it's on, I really don't know. Uh, but uh, to, to get into what you else you wanted to ask about, uh, this was back in 98. And back then, uh, the energy of a human being at the best you could do would be about 8,000. Well, we just have finished making another film here today to upgrade a webinar that we filmed a few years ago that we're going to um, put, make available again to people. And it needed some changes. So I, I just uh, explained uh, what I'm about to explain to you is the energy has changed over the period of how long has it been? 24 years that I have been measuring energy. Now, yeah. maybe somebody somewhere measures energy more than I do, but I don't know who they are because I do this every day. And the reason why is I have a lot of people wanting help. And the first thing I do is I measure their energy. Well, if it's zero, I know they have problems. 
if it's on my scale I'm using right now, let's just say 20,000 or so. Now, okay, yeah, you probably need a few things, but uh, you're not in really bad shape. So I've learned to a degree of what affects the energy of a human being and what can be done to correct it. Uh, so I don't want to give figures today because they may, they're probably constantly changing, but mm -hmm. let's just say this, that in the last 24 years, energy has risen dramatically higher than I ever expected it to go. Well, we're able to do more things with it now than we could do then because we simply have more energy to do them with. Uh, back then, if I, I could clean up one house for a family, and I used to do the, have to go and do this physically on site. Well, not anymore. I clean up places in Australia and Italy and Germany and uh, uh, basically around the world. Because yeah. uh, when you're working with energy, distance is not a factor. Yeah. Uh, it, it really isn't. Hey, Raymond, uh, uh, yeah. on, the, on that point, the, that there's more energy now than ever. I think that, that fascinates me because, you know, it can be used for positive, like you say, and it can also be used for negative, which we see both happening right now. We see you being able to, you know, harness this energy and do such great things, but we also see people that are using it for things that are not so good. But the thing I love about you too, and, and just in watching your videos, you, you and, and by the way, you are an Einstein to me. You're very humble, you downplay, you downplay a lot of things, but you really are tapping into so much of your mind, but you you make people feel like they can do it. And that's what I love, you know, so people have all this energy and you are such a great worker with energy, but your work is, is so unique in that you're not trying to say, look at me, I'm so great. You're just trying to say, look, Here's here's me. I do this. You can do it, too. And that's what I love about your work. That's what's so refreshing about you to me. Well, every day, practically, I get emails asking me, what can I do this or this, whatever it is. I have a standard answer. Try it and find out. That's how I learn. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, yes, it uh, um, and really, my goal is to help people empower themselves. That's yeah. really the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, so I figured, well, if I did it, most anybody else could do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, people ask me, how do you do this? I said, well, I can answer it in one word, by intent. Yeah. I do everything by intent. And you say, well, why does it work for you and not work for me? It's because I have spent 48 years practicing it. And we get good at what we do a lot of. And I'm fortunate to be in this business because uh, every day I get a new uh, batch of people to work on that need, need help. Maybe their problems are somewhat similar, and I handle as many of them as I can. That doesn't mean I get to everybody, but I, because mm -hmm. I don't. But I, I handle as many as I can. But what I really like to do is teach the people to help themselves where they don't even need me anymore. Yeah. How does someone get better at intent, Raymond? So you've been doing it for 48 years. I think you nailed it right on the head. A lot of people say, you know, okay, I, I want, I intend this. And then they go, oh, but what if it doesn't happen? They pull back, they lose their certainty. The thing I've noticed in you, you are just so committed to like intent, like you don't back off. And how do people get that to that point? Uh, the only word I could give you on that is practice. Okay. Uh, you have to believe in yourself. And the way I say it is that success builds confidence and confidence builds more success. So every time we accomplish something that we haven't accomplished before, my question is always, okay, what do we do now? What's next? <laughs> uh, I had a, I know I'll, I will be very vague about this for obvious reasons, but there is a prison somewhere in the U S hmm. where the the person that I happened to be acquainted with, not really met them, but talked to them on the phone, seemed like a very good person. They were in prison for something they really didn't do. Uh, and I, I really believe that. But the temperature in the prison was 46 degrees. They mm -hmm. had no heat at all. The air conditioner was running 24 hours a day. They had no, nothing warm to get close. This one guy had to cut the leg, uh, cut the arms out of a jacket and put over his feet to keep him from freezing. Mm. 
And I got a phone call on that. And that was late one night. By the next morning, I had an email saying the temperature in the prison rose 19 degrees. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Hopefully nobody is there uh, is listening to this. So <laughs> anyway, that's what we did. Now, yeah. you say, how did you do that? I just thought about this and I think this is a form of torture and I'm opposed to that. So I'm going to do something about it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to raise the temperature in that prison. And uh, I didn't know by how much I just asked to raise the temperature. Wow. And it, I didn't know I couldn't do it. That's going to be my standard answer on practically everything. Yeah. See, if you do something, something might, if you do nothing, nothing's going to happen. If you do something, something might happen. So yeah. people think that I really know what I'm doing. That's really not true. Uh, I just do something and it'll usually happen. Not always, but usually. I love that though, because so many people talk themselves out of it before they even start, right? When they, they have intention, like if somebody like this is the Global Energy Healing Summer Summit, somebody you know has a certain disease and they look at the statistics and they look on the internet and they see, you know, see only a certain amount of people get over it. You don't even go there. You just know that energy is energy. Thought, thought, can, uh, thought can change energy. And you don't worry about data, statistics, probabilities. You just, boom, you just lock in. I love that. That is so powerful. Well, it's the only way I know how to work. And yeah. uh, Einstein made another pretty intelligent uh, statement. He said, energy follows thought. That works good or bad. Uh, if people are always whining and complaining and, uh, about whatever's wrong with them, they're not going to get better. Uh, I've made some statements last week saying I have never known anyone to get well by complaining about illness. I've never known anyone to become wealthy by complaining about poverty. Yeah. Why? Because energy follows thought. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. In your books, you have so many amazing stories. I hope people will read your books and, and go to your site. What is your, what is your website, Raymond? Just because I know people are probably already interested, like how do I find? It, just RaymondGrace.us. RaymondGrace.us and Raymond is R A Y M O N, no D on the end. That's correct. And we Raymond have another Grace. one for our foundation. And the foundation is what we were using to promote uh, water cleanup. And we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, I have cleaned up a little bit of water, not, not a lot, but a little bit on six continents. And um, the reason I got into that, this goes back about 34 years ago. Uh, I had a little kid, April was just a little kid at the time. And I was reading a little about water, how that we had a very small percentage of it on the planet that was drinkable. And I thought, well, every day more and more is getting polluted. So if my kids and my descendants are going to have decent water, somebody's got to do something. I volunteered for the job. I had no <laughs> clue how I was going to do it. At first, I learned to energize one small little cup of water in my hands. And then I found out I could energize water at a distance. And well, one of her best stories occurred uh, back in 02 in uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta. No, Saskatchewan. No. Yeah, no, it was Alberta. Yeah. Yeah, it was in, Sa yeah. Or, sorry, it was in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Uh, there was um, a well there that uh, I had been asked to visit while I was traveling up in that area. And uh, it had a lot of arsenic in it. Well, I didn't know anything about arsenic. I'm not a <laughs> chemist. But uh, the folks asked me if I could do something to the water. It, uh, it had a really, really high concentration of arsenic. So I said, well, I don't know. Let me try. And, and the fellow says, well, you can't energize your water and pour into the well. It's got a closed cap on it. I said, well, okay, let me go see what I can do. So I went out and basically I talked to the water mentally. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, let me know what happens. A few weeks later, I get a very enthusiastic phone call that the water had been tested by the Canadian Board of Health and 90% of the arsenic is gone. Wow. I said, okay, uh, have it tested again one day. I'll work out on it again for you. And uh, the next time it was tested, there was uh, very, barely a trace of arsenic. Wow, amazing. We and, but you know, what did I do? I transformed arsenic into water. Yeah. And, and, and you didn't know you couldn't do it, right? That's why you did it, right? That's all the that I couldn't do it. I, I love it. it. And so, hey, to people listening, like, this is not, this is not fairy tale stuff we're talking about. This is, 
This is not, you know, you know, uh, people that are just making up stories. This is this is real stuff. And there's so many stories of what Raymond's done. And all of you listening and watching, you can do it too. That's what he's about. He's trying to tell you, you can do it. Don't just, you know, put him up on the exalted place. He does deserve to be there, by the way, just for the amazing work he's done for humanity. But his, his whole life is about showing us that we all can do it. Like he's impacted me with his belief system. So uh, tell about the story. I love their story about uh, the, the fields, the hay fields. Oh yeah, I, that's yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, because I was working for a farmer and I have a saying, it goes like this, it's bad manners to cuss a farmer with your mouth full. <laughs> uh, I got a phone call one night from one of my friends that said, uh, I've got a problem, I wonder if you could help me. And I said, well, I will, if I can, what do you need? He said, well, I have a 20 acre uh, field of alfalfa. This was a small time dairy farmer. And he said, uh, had some weeds growing in it. So I uh, called the farm uh, supply uh, uh, people to come out and spray for weeds. The truck driver picked up the wrong uh, jug of chemicals and sprayed 20 acres with Roundup. Now, uh, there was something he didn't tell me, which I'll put in just a little bit later. I felt the free at the uh, field had just been sprayed the day before. That wasn't true. Uh, but I said, how long will it take you to get over this? He said, well, uh, a year, I've got to plow it all up. Well, that means he loses the hay crop for all of his cows for a whole year. Have to reseed it, alfalfa feed it, uh, seed is expensive, and then start all over. And I said, don't plow the field up for two days. Give me two days to work on it and let me know what happened. Well, I didn't hear from him until 30 days later, he sent a picture. The alfalfa was four feet tall, which is really tall for alfalfa. Yeah. And where he had been getting three cuttings a year off of that field, he got five cuttings that year. Each wow. cut was larger than the was the year before. So we literally double the yield of alfalfa on that 20 acres. And what I, he asked me what I did. I said, I transformed the Roundup into fertilizer. Yeah. And if people don't know what Roundup is, that's a highly poisonous, kills everything in sight type chemical. And, but with your mind, again, using your mind, your thought to, to change matter, you turned <laughs> Roundup poison into fertilizer. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, it was just what came to mind. So I thought, yeah. well, let's try it. If I do, if it don't help him, nothing's going to happen. Right. To bankrupt a small farmer. Yeah. And I like to help farmers. They, uh, they want to keep the country going. So, uh, yeah, I was, I've been really proud of that. Uh, yeah. just uh, very thankful to be able to help people like that. So Raymond, you used your imagination for that. Like even coming up for the idea of, okay, it's round up, it's poison. A lot of people say there's nothing can be done. You're like, all right, let's turn it into fertilizer. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't tee this up at the beginning, but talk a little bit about imagination because I think that's where a lot of people fall short. They only see things one way. You don't tend to do that. You have such a different way of looking at the world and matter and energy. Uh, how can we? How can we grow? What do you? How do you teach people to grow their imagination and the power of their thought? Okay, well, let, before we get into that, let me say this. Yeah. I did not, there was something I did not know until months later when this farmer was in my class and I asked him to tell the story. I thought it might be more accurate than when, yeah. when I told him. What he said was that the field, well, hadn't been spread the day before he called me. It had been spread, uh, been sprayed a few, de several days, and there was not a single living alfalfa plant in the field. Wow. Now, if he had told me that, my <laughs> logical mind would have said, there's nothing I can do. Ah. If he didn't tell me, I didn't know. <laughs> okay, now, how do we expand our imagination? Well, oh, I create pictures in my mind. The, the, the brain thinks in pictures better than it thinks in words. Uh, so the way I tell people to start out is every day, uh, give thanks for what you want to happen that day. I have a list of affirmations that are reasonably good, I think, for, uh, for folks. But you want to imagine what 
you have to focus on what you want, not what you don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the best way I know to tell you, because if you're worrying about uh, everything that can go wrong, you are literally feeding energy into what can go wrong. Yeah. And, pes uh, and listen carefully on this one, I, all the folks out there listening, pessimists are seldom disappointed. <laughs> yeah they get they get what they expect right so, the first rule of success is think of what you want not what you don't want but and then practice uh if you have problems with uh, people in your family imagine getting along yeah yeah uh, that's the first thing if you imagine arguing with them you're just creating another argument yeah so basically learn to think of what you want and to realize that you're an intelligent human being and you're not limited by what can you can do. Yeah. And uh, you have to break out of the molds that people have been put into of what they can't do. I love it. Yeah. And as you said, you get a lot of practice because you're working with so many people, your imagination's just popping every day in so many situations where you don't let it go down to the negative. You focus on the positive. And like you said, you know, you don't win every time, but but you win a heck of a lot and you've helped so many people. Well, let me put it this way. The future is composed of thoughts not yet materialized. Mm -hmm. We produce the thoughts. So we literally create our own future, good or bad. Yeah. And, and people have heard that before sometimes that, you know, thoughts are things, they're energy. But what you've shown is the power of, to, you know, shown to me and so many others, just the true power of that statement. It's not just a statement. It is real. Like you are getting tangible results in the physical world by using your thoughts almost in, you know, almost like an alchemist, right? By, by creating with your thoughts. And, and everybody, by the way, what, what, one thing I do want to say, though, everybody's getting this same result that you're getting, but a lot of it is bad things because their thoughts are going there and they're like why'd that happen well look inside your head <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, I think most everybody creates the future yeah uh, the way to think and the way to act see thoughts are the first step of creativity because your thoughts will determine your actions and your actions will determine your future mm -hmm. so if you want a better future change change your thoughts when you yeah. change your thoughts you'll change your actions yeah. Uh, people wonder how I get as much done as I do on the farm. It doesn't matter if I'm stringing barbed wire, digging post holes, picking up rocks, raising a garden, picking tomatoes. It doesn't matter. Before I start, I will create an image in my mind of me doing the work and the job completed. That's why I get so much done. Yeah, I love it. So somebody who maybe has an illness, what you're saying is, you know, even though maybe their body's in pain, they have to really start using their mind to see them healed, right? You know, well, far beyond where they are right now. Well, there's a lot of factors, too, far too many to go into now, but there's, okay. uh, I have pretty much a list of what affects people's energy. And when mm -hmm. that, uh, those things that affect the energy or lower the energy are corrected, the energy will go up. Nice. I mean, every time. Yeah. Yeah. And Raymond, you, 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 uh, part of your work, you said, you know, is dowsing and you've got your uh, pendulum in your left hand. I think you're holding right now. I think I saw it pop up a few, are you right hand? There right you go. Hand. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and, uh, but I, I love in one of your talks, cause that is a great uh, tool and, and there's courses that you teach on that. But one of the things you said in one of your videos was that, you know, at the end of the day, you don't, I mean, I'm not paraphrasing, but you don't need a pendulum. You just need a tent, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the power is up here. Uh, people want to give their power to an object. Mm -hmm. uh, the object really, in my opinion, has no power. This is a, simply a bullet on the chain. That's all it is. Uh, but what it does, it's a tool. Like a hammer is a tool for driving a nail. A wrench is a tool for turning a nut on a bolt. Okay, this is a tool to tell me how long to focus on something. Because if I'm focusing on something, it will spin either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending upon what the goal is. And the longer it spins indicates the more energy that is required to correct a problem. Sometimes it'll go around three or four times like that. I'm just faking this one. And then sometimes it will spin and spin and spin for a long time. So that's, it's, it's just really a tool. So uh, anybody listening out there, don't give your power to a pendulum. 
uh, because it really has none. The power is up here in the mind. Yeah, I, I like to made me laugh. Uh, a lot of things you say make me laugh, right? You know, just you're, you, you're, you're a good, fun guy. But you were talking about in the beginning, your pendulum, which has been a long time. And then you said, you know, I had to communicate with it. I said, hey, I live here on planet Earth. I don't have all day. You got to work a little quicker. So you even used That's your- That's exactly what I did. <laughs> yeah. I, I did that because I started doing the pendulum. Hey, it's been a long time. I used Raymond's thing. Hey, you got to work a little quicker. <laughs> well, not only that, when I was first learning, it didn't come easy. I yeah. spent three years trying to get a pendulum to move a quarter of an inch. I was just too stubborn to quit. Yeah. And I was working on an old fellow at the time. He was, I think, president of the American Society of Dowsers. His name was Walt Woods. Had a great deal of respect for him and uh, was friends with him. And his pendulum was going like this, <laughs> whereas mine was going like that. <laughs> and I said, hey, you, I want you to work like Walt's. It has ever since. So I've yeah. had people in class that couldn't get their pen to work. And I said, well, tell it to work like mine. It does. <laughs> yeah. And Raymond's uh, spinning it. But but what actually happens when you douse is it'll it'll move on its own through okay. the energies, picking up the energies and, and intelligence and things like that. So that's what he's talking about. But I love that. Like, hey, work like his or, you know, you need to work a little quicker. So that's that's all intent. I love that. Hey, one thing that I think that could be really, really valuable is uh, you talk about time travel, particularly with like trauma and things like that, that people might have had in their lives. Yeah, I do. Uh, I've done a fair amount of this. I'm going to be real brief on it. Mm -hmm. I found a way that I could go back in time to prevent things from happening. Now, you're wondering what kind of things. Well, all I've worked on is just small personal things. I don't think I could go back and stop World War II uh, doing anything like that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, what I've worked with mostly is trauma and abuse. Well, abuse and trauma kind of goes hand in hand. And I found that I could go back in time and stop the event from happening energetically. And the person, not in all cases, but in most, will feel it instantly. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a lot of I just I just get a lot of abuse cases like that to work on or people that need help. And uh, maybe all I'm doing is changing their perception of it. But I have a method to go back. And actually, if you watch that film I made for the West Coast Dowsers, I give a very real example in that film. We don't need to do it now, but uh, I gave a very real example in that film. And in, uh, I think that film is on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, actually, quite a few of them are. And uh, it was, I think the title of it was just uh, the talk I made for the West Coast Dowsers. Feel yeah. free to watch it. Anybody out there listening, feel free to watch any of my stuff. We've got to have a YouTube channel uh, that David takes care of. I don't really know what all's on there, but most, uh, many of our films are on that channel and they're, they're free. So feel free to watch them. Well, you kind of inspired me with that one too, just to go back to my father passed away when I was very young. And even though I don't, you know, feel the trauma every day, because I was there when the, the army officers came to tell my mom that my dad was killed in Vietnam, you know, there's probably still some element. And I just went back, not in, 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 I, changed like i changed that experience i had of seeing my mom like you know horrified and the army officers and and just went back before it happened just by listening to your video or maybe i read about it in the book too because you talked about like uh going back before a car accident happened or a, the yeah. one lady who had the scars that went away when she went back before her trauma and i just went back and and changed that and then changed you know different things where i think about it through time i would take myself forward and again i'm not saying my, my dad's not going to show up but i did feel different i felt different it was a shift in me and it was really powerful so thank you for that that was really a You're quite cool welcome thing. and i'm glad that you were able to use that because a lot of times i just use the term neutralize which means take energy away from it yeah. neutralize the sadness of an event upon someone and they can feel it mostly yeah. immediately. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. It's so and that story you referred to there, that person, a girl being set on a hot stove with 15 scars on her, those scars disappeared. Now that one really got my attention. Yeah. So what Raymond did, he, he took the girl 
prior to or you neutralize the energy in some way and literally she had scars that that how quickly did they disappear was it instantly uh, it took about a month about a month because the energy from that trauma where she was being abused was neutralized the scars weren't there anymore i mean it's that this is incredible stuff i know everyone's like is this real <laughs> well i wondered the same thing <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was going to happen. I get a lot of surprises in this work. Yeah. So why why are you so committed to helping people? What is it inside of you that that you know you're you're uh, seventy seven years old? I know you're still growing really strong. You say you wake up at early in the day. You're always working either on your your land or helping people. But a lot of people who are 77 are retired and, and just doing what they want to do. You're so driven still to help humanity. What is it about you that, that keeps that drive going so strong? Well, the real truth is I'm doing what I want to do also. Yeah. Uh, because I believe that we have more to do than pass through time and take up space. Mm. And I set a goal a long time ago, not only to help clean up the water on the planet, but also stop as much abuse as possible, but just be kind to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do I want to do it? I guess I just don't like to see people suffer. Yeah. And, uh, but then again, I'll give you a simpler definition. When people ask me why I do anything, I have three answers. So I give all three answers. It needed to be done. I could, and I wanted to. Nice. That's yeah. it in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, we have a choice. We do something or we do nothing. Yeah. You do something. You've done more than something. You've done an amazing amount of good work and, and so many people love you because of it. Uh, what, one thing I saw also in a recent video was you had your problem uh, package. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that could be helpful for people. Could you share that with them? Uh, I will be glad to, and I'll come, come keep it brief. But uh, if you go to Raymond Grace YouTube channel and look up uh, something called Ozark Research Institute, mm -hmm. uh, I made this talk for their convention uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So rather than go through a long list of things, which I had been doing, I think I really need to make this simpler so people can do it. So I'm going to actually do it for them. So um, I've made a film on things that affect most people around the world continually. Mm -hmm. uh, and without going through all that, which would take up time, just uh, uh, do a Google search on uh, a problem package uh, or on, on my, or probably just on my YouTube channel. Raymond Reeves problem. It, but no, so play it all the way to, it's only about 15 minutes long. Okay. And play it all the way to the end because at the end, I tell the folks how I built myself a new knee that works perfectly fine. I'm walking as good now as I did 30 years ago. Yeah. And the problem package is some major problems where this, this film you made, this video you made has the energy and then they can tune into it and use intent each day to be protected uh, from these things that could potentially show up, right? Right. Uh, and uh, there's really not enough of me to go around. So I do the alternative and that's teach people to help themselves. Yeah. So rather than try to, I, I don't have time to talk to everybody on the phone or email them. So I just make a film uh, that shows the folks how to do it. And then it's available for free to whoever wants it. Yeah, no, you've been so generous with that. So what, what, what are you, you've trained your mind in so many powerful ways, even to, You've trained your mind to uh, be notified if family members are in danger so that you can help change the energy. Mm -hmm. What are some good habits? Uh, again, you know, uh, not everything applies to everybody, but I think you, you know enough of humanity. What are some good programs that all of us should be potentially programming in our minds? What are some choices that you could give us to do that. Okay, I'm going from memory, but uh, I have a list that I pass out in class mm -hmm. uh, of affirmations. There's 10 yeah. of them. Yeah. Uh, and among them are, and they're no, in no certain order, is I'm always at the right place at the right time. Yeah. I find that we have the ability uh, to, and I'll use the word influence time, I won't say control, but to influence time. For example, I have driven 1,500 miles from home to Blackhawk, South Dakota, and I got there 15 minutes early. 
<laughs> I mean, you can't you can't map quest things like that. I have actually driven some uh, about 250 miles. Told the person I would be there at five o'clock. I went through road construction, two rainstorms, stopped to run errands at five o'clock and drive in the driveway. Yeah. I mean, I've just done stuff like this for years. And what's that affirmation again that you say? What is it? Uh, I'm always in the room. Yeah, what I would do there is I would just set a goal. I need to be at such and such a place at this time. But uh -huh. what I also do is say I am always at the right place at the right time. Always at the right place, right time. I love that. Yeah. That's because awesome. See, every, every car accident that happened out there would not have happened if one driver had been two seconds faster or slower. Yeah. Yeah. So timing is everything. It's, it's what either, it either keeps you alive or kills you. Yeah. And it's, people get killed because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm. Now I'll give you one about being aware of danger to my, my family and my friends. Uh, I'll introduce my friend. Uh, have, I've introduced him in a number of my films. Uh, uh, Jeff Jones, he's a man that's lived 24 years on water. When I taught him to energize water, he didn't need to eat anymore. So he's, he's quite a walking miracle really. Um, Whoa. and, uh, I was down in, in Florida uh, a few years back and I woke up and I think, Oh, I got to call Jeff. There's something wrong. I said, Jeff, where are you? He said, I'm on interstate 77 heading into West Virginia. I said, get off the road real quick. He's well, there's an exit right here. I said, take it. I said, I don't know what it is, but there's something really bad right in front of you. He called me back that afternoon. There was a landslide that would have blocked the road or did block the road for the next 24 hours. He just wow. got off just in time. Wow. How did I know? I didn't really know. I just had this feeling that there's something wrong. I need to notify him. And when he told me where he was, I just said, okay, get off the highway. There's something wrong. Wow. I did not know it was going to be a landslide. I had no idea what it was. I just knew it wasn't good. Yeah. Amazing. What but about for healing? What, what, what's a good, good affirmation for healing, Raymond? Because so many people on this global energy healing summit are probably suffering from chronic disease. Their mind okay. doesn't have the right thoughts in it right now. Well, um, the answer is probably going to be different than what you expect. Okay. When you wake up every morning, even before you get out of bed. And the reason why I'm saying this is that you're in the alpha brain frequency and any thought you have in the alpha brain frequency has more power then when after you get up and drink a cup of coffee and get going. So mm -hmm. you want to do all of your concentration in a low brain frequency. That's where the power of thought lies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I suggest to everybody, don't ever ask for anything. Give thanks for everything. So when you wake up every morning, give thanks for a strong, healthy body. I do. Yeah. Uh, give thanks for a good place to live, a good family, good friends. Uh, don't complain about anything. Just yeah. um, by giving thanks for things, it, it really makes a difference. I can tell you something that happened yesterday. Uh, I have a, this is a small knife that I carry with me here. Uh, and it was made by a, my friend, Gil Hibben, who made the Rambo knife. And <laughs> I, when, I was visiting Gil one day and he said, uh, I want to give you a knife. And I said, well, give me the smallest one you got. So this is when he gave me. Well, uh, I reached for it yesterday and it wasn't there. And I said, okay, wh what has happened to it? Yeah. So I just thought for a moment and I remembered what it looked like. It even got his name uh, on the blade right here. Uh, yeah. I focused on it now, I remember exactly what it looked like. I walked out of the house. I didn't go a hundred yards. I picked up the knife. <laughs> it was laying in the, out, out in the field somewhere? Or right in out the, the field, yes. But you walked right to it. I walked right to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that a number of times for things. Yeah, yeah. You create a mental picture of it and give yourself the suggestion, I'm going to bring it to me or I'm going to find it. Yeah. And uh, it, it works pretty good. It that awesome. hasn't worked every time, but it, it yeah. works most of the time. Yeah, and I remember back in the day, people would say, you know, imagine that the perfect parking spot's there for you. I'm like, ah, oh, does that really work? But I knew people that did it, so I started, you know, perfect place, perfect time, or... Yeah, so powerful. Go ahead. Yeah. You're going to say something? I could give a lot of stories on timing, but I won't uh, because yeah. it just takes up more time. There's more things to cover. But uh, this happens quite often uh, where I am, uh, like recently, uh, I just happened to be at the right spot. I was driving my tractor around the side of the hill when a truck come by and slowed down. And I wondered, well, 
why is he slowing down? When I come back, he was waiting on me at the gate. And he said, where are you going with all that wood? I said, well, I don't really need it all. Would you like to have it? I gave him seven truckloads of wood. <laughs> so he may even have to haul it off. It supplied him with the winter supply of wood. But yeah. if I'd missed it two seconds, one way or the other, yeah, he wouldn't have seen me driving there. He wouldn't have known it was available. Yeah. This has been so cool, so refreshing. I was excited about it, and it, it, it lived up to every expectation I had. Everybody, I hope you, you're really enjoying uh, this talk with Raymond. And the big thing that I got from Raymond, and I hope you're getting too, is that he's just a guy that goes out and does it. Like, you know, we can all do this, but he does it. He does it with intent. He does it with certainty. And even the times where it doesn't work out, he doesn't let that, you know, cause him to not do it again. He just goes back out, practices, learns, gets even better. And thank you so much for sharing your incredible gift, but but even just your your mind, your mindset, your way of doing things. It's really so cool. And I know you're helping so many people, Raymond. Well, I'm, I'm glad to help people. That's what uh, makes life worthwhile. Um, my life is just different. Uh, and at the end of the day, if I have made somebody else's life better, then it's been a good day. Um, so it's just, it's just the way I think. Um, also, uh, if anybody wants to look at my foundation site, I don't think I gave it. It's RaymondGraceFoundation.org. Yes. Uh, so uh, it'll give you a little bit of an idea on our, what we do. We have a, um, a cleanup project for water. We have... Um, energy clearings as you can sign up for, uh, all that. If anybody wants to take a look at it, well, feel free to do so. Awesome. So they can participate in the cleaning up water and energy clearing. Well, that's the plan. I didn't have time to put a lot of stories in here today, but yeah, yeah uh, we've, uh, we've actually uh, used their methods to clean up an entire lake for our, uh, entire cities. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, we, we talked about the water up in Alberta, but you've done things in India and Australia and in and, and so many different places. And, and so check out the foundation and, and also check out Raymond's uh, website, RaymondGrace.us. And then the foundation is, is uh, the Raymond Grace. Is it the Raymond Grace Foundation or? No, just, just RaymondGraceFoundation.org. Dot org. Yeah, you are you are uh, not just a national treasure because I think you're an international treasure and and just a shining light that has lifted so many people. Raymond, I know everybody that watched this interview, they might have had some doubts like, wait a minute, you know, can you really do that? Can that be done? And that's your problem, people, the doubts. So get rid of the doubts and just start doing it like Raymond. But Raymond, thank you so much for being on and and I, I hope I get to continue our conversations because you teach me so much every time we talk. Well, you, uh, you let me know when you want to talk again. I'll be glad to talk to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. God bless you. And, and thank you for everything you do for humanity. Thank you for the opportunity to share with people. If you're enjoying these presentations so far, I urge you to consider taking home lifetime VIP access to the entire Global Energy Healing Summit at a special discount if you act right now. You're not only getting on-demand access to all the interviews and bonuses, you're also helping support our mission in getting this wonderful health information out to as many people as possible. Well, I am very excited to introduce our next guest. He's someone that I actually haven't had a conversation with. I don't know a lot about. Um, I only know a little bit about his work and I'm super excited to ex explore it with you and, and to share what he does because it's, it's truly amazing. Dr. Eric Pearl ran a chiropractic practice in Los Angeles before discovering reconnective healing. One day his patients began to report healings when he simply held his hands near them without physically touching them. So he went in search of the universal wisdom behind what was happening. Unlike today's known forms of energy healing, this work can be practiced without complex technique or elaborate ritual. Through Dr. Pearl's journey of research and discovery, it became clear that the appropriate name for this work is reconnective healing. Now recognized and supported by science, reconnective healing facilitates healings for people that are often instantaneous and can last a lifetime. Feeling compelled to teach others Eric's work has taken him to over 100 countries and has affected millions of people. Eric's hope is that one day everyone will learn to access this natural ability and will use it to heal themselves and others. 
Dr. Pearl has been featured in top media, including The Dr. Oz Show, The New York Times, and CNN. His internationally best-selling book, The Reconnection, Healing Others, Heal Yourself, now in over 39 languages, and has been endorsed by such notables as Deepak Chopra. Dr. Eric, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, very honored for the interview. So, so take me back to that, that moment when you're doing kind of general chiropractic stuff and all of a sudden you recognized or your patients recognized that there was something happening with, with your hands and, and the energy. What, what was that like the first time that was kind of brought up in your office? Well, um, it's funny because you ask, you know, what was that first moment? And the, the first moment is really not ever the first moment. It's the first moment that we become aware that it steps into our cognitive consciousness. So we won't go all the way back to the birth process. How about if we start a little past that? Um, I went home one night and um, let's just say it was an unusual evening. I went to sleep and an hour later, I was awakened by a very bright light. And it, when I opened my eyes to look, it wasn't anything seemingly spiritual or metaphysical. It was simply the lamp next to my bed. For some reason, it turned itself on. At that one for 10 years, it wasn't in the habit of turning itself on, but there it was. And my bedroom door, which I always closed before I went to sleep, was open, which, of course, brought me to wonder it felt a little bit like someone was in my house and logically then it seemed like someone could be in my house so i got up and found the largest knife i could get my hands on and i had an old empty can of pepper spray from a self-defense course i'd probably taken 15 years prior and my doberman pincher and the three of us you know all of us went searching through the house to discover that we couldn't find anyone so i decided to go back to sleep because i knew if i were you know up all night i'd be erect for my patients the next day and I went back to sleep. But that Monday morning when I went into my office, a few strange things started happening. My patients started telling me that they could feel my hands before I touched them. I said, oh yeah, sure, you can close your eyes. And they close their eyes and hold my hands in different directions and angles. And they could tell me whether it seemed to be aimed towards their right foot or their left ear. Um, as I moved my hands around them, their bodies went into involuntary movements, which later we called registers as, as more and more of my patients continued having this response. And um, their eyes would involuntarily flicker back and forth and move all over the place. And when they opened their eyes, they told me they were seeing colors they'd never seen before, smelling flowers they had never smelled before, and um, that they had experienced being places that they had never been before, um, being spoken to, communicated with. And I thought, well, these are, this is interesting. People are having this experience and I'm watching it. It never happened before in my up to 12 years of practice that day. So maybe I'd better pay attention to it. it became more intriguing as um, some of my patients who came in in wheelchairs walked out without the wheelchair, not all of them, but some of them started getting phone calls from parents and some of the younger kids saying um, this child who had cerebral palsy or this one had epilepsy and now they're walking and running and playing and speaking normally and they don't need their medications. What's going on? What did you do? I said, I didn't do anything and don't tell anybody. Now, honestly, if you read the book, The Reconnection, you'll find there's much more fascinating detail to this story leading up to this than this. So I often sum it up by saying I went home one night thinking I was a doctor. I came back on a Monday and I was something else. I mean, why not? My parents always told me I was something else, but I just, just <laughs> this is what they had in mind. But the funny thing is, is people started asking me to teach this. And I said, you've got to be insane. And they say, well, you know, we, we saw you on, you know, media started coming. We saw you on these TV shows and these things and we're watching what's happening and you've got to be able to teach us. And I'm thinking, I don't know what this is, but you know, it's funny. Things appear 
one way and we see things the way we're used to as as it wasn't and then it was it was over here and now it showed up here and time and space and distance and all of those illusions but they were very very real to me and people started saying teach us and i said i don't know how to teach us i'm standing there waving my hands in the air looking like an idiot i said you go outside wave your hands in the air let me know what your neighbors say about you but um i finally um gave in and started to teach for the very first time in an adult night school um, called the learning annex in los angeles and um, I showed up with all the notes. I could think, how can I teach this? I guess I'll make notes. So I try to remember facts and things and ideas. And I walked in and I looked at all the people and they looked at me and my mind went blank. I had a massage table one, I opened it up. I threw the notes away and I said, here's the story. Here's what happened to me. This is what it feels like to me. I'm gonna let you feel it. And then you're going to take turns. I'm going to show you how to feel, play, and move. One of you will lie down. One of you will stand up. And as they did that, I mean, all of a sudden, people's bodies started moving all around. I, as we watched, as I said, now watch. You can tune in and feel a sensation and start to pull with it or stretch it. And as you get further away from the person, watch what happens. And the people's bodies would respond larger. I said, this is clearly not just the energy of energy healing. Because what do we know about energy? We know that the further away you move, the weaker it becomes. I'm not talking about distance healing when you're halfway around the globe. I'm just saying you start three inches, you go three yards, it gets weaker. You go 30 yards, it gets weaker. Not this. This had brought us beyond that, beyond subsets of energy that we label by the different common techniques that have been around hundreds of years and 10 years. Each technique has us focus into a certain area of the energy. But reconnective healing, what we found was, see, it, it, there's no technique. I mean, there's no technique. You are, how can you learn it? I said, I'll let you feel it. I'll show you. And then you begin to realize that all we're doing is receiving. So what happens is this technique is here and this technique is here and this one's here and this one's here and it's all letting us gain different aspects of energy. It's just like all those windows behind me, each window square shows a different portion of the picture and windows on the other side of the room show something else and windows on another side of the room show something else but even if we run around the whole house and look at each window we'll never see the whole picture because each window is limited by the frame and further limited by the wall that supports the frame so only when we go outside of all those window frames can we see the whole picture only when we let go of our techniques and go outside and have a party can we see 360 degrees in all direction and more and more today, I believe that the world is coming to understand through releasing concepts of duality and separation. That technique is designed ultimately to dissolve, to self-destruct, to disappear, to allow us to step into the freedom. And the freedom is not just that we get the gift of looking out of each tiny little window. Not that we just get the gifts of the different energies, the different Reikis and Shigongs and Jin Shins and Jureis and the uh, new techniques and the old techniques. The gift is, it's the reconnection of all of energy by letting go of those dividers we've created to focus in. And then the gift beyond that is we access new aspects of light and information. We let go of the finite approaches and we become the infinite not just the word for infinite because we all know the words for chi and ki and prana and they're supposed to be infinite but not the way they're practiced i didn't know any of this i'd never studied energy healing techniques like i just said i went home one night like this i came back in and now i'm this so the discovery the key to healing is the freedom of beingness, which is not found until 
the training wheels come off the bicycle. That's the only time you have the true freedom of riding the bicycle. Until then, you're only mastering the bicycle with training wheels, but you're not mastering the bicycle. We've been spending a lot of time learning, getting a sense of our balance with the training wheels of healing. We've been mastering our energy healing techniques. We're in a new point of the world today. It's time. We don't need another energy healing technique. It's not time to master more energy healing techniques. Now it's time to master healing itself, to master the bicycle itself. And that comes with freedom. So what happened? I don't know how to explain it. I know the way it looked was that I held my hands near my patients. I started feeling sensations. I moved them further away. Things were going on with them. I walked out in the hallway and I just looked at them through the door and played like this and more and more was going on and changing with them. Something was happening. And then the discovery was that once we learn to become, step into the awareness of this, we allow ourselves to be the receivers that we truly are by our natural design. And in that reception, we transform. We've been thinking we've been learning energy healing. We've been thinking we've been learning healing. We haven't been learning anything. We have been awakening to the knowingness that comprises us and the recognition that we are all one. So we have hurdles to overcome because of the way things look. It looks like you're in one part of the country and I'm in another part. It looks like um, these windows are behind me and I'm in front of them. And if I'm going to send a healing to you, it looks like I have to send it. Me sending it is only separation. I have to come from one place to another. But we don't. We receive. And when we let go of the concept of sending, we let go of the concept of the illusion of separation, of distance. And in that, we recognize the unity and the oneness that we all are. And in that, there is no longer fear. There's no longer ego. There's no longer the, illus the illusionary need, the illusory need for protection to keep us safe because we realize that we've never been safer. There's nothing we need safety from. There's no longer the illusory need for objects such as crystals and wands to make us better because in receiving this and understanding this, we are infinite and you can't add to infinite so all those things we've been spending our money on to make us more to make us better to keep us safe the real gift the lesson that they brought is that they're all illusion give them away hang them on the christmas trees don't tell people what why we bought them because they're going to buy into that same thing that we're freeing ourselves up from just say here's a gorgeous piece of jewelry here's a beautiful crystal to look nice in the corner over there in your room bring some color give it away give it away give away everything and when you're afraid that you might give away too much give that away too because you'll find that there is only one thing you can never give away and that's the oneness of who you are and i bet you thought that was a simple short little question that you asked me i can't even remember how the question began <laughs> i'm just going to stop talking now for a moment so that you can ask whatever you want <laughs> no that's beautiful i mean there's there's um a few practices and and teachings that that i've received that revolve around kind of awake awareness and this is exactly what this sounds like this sounds like um stepping when you when i i figured out when i was templated and, and awakening this process of of expanding my awareness to this awake state it's 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 hard to put even into words because it's it's outside of uh space and time it's completely awake everywhere and nowhere no, zero connection uh, you can recognize the the connected aspect outside of mind even i mean you're a present but but it's outside of mind um and when i've learned to get into that space there's it's just pure truth there's there's just awakening to this idea that 
um, there's a divine intelligence. It's not even a, a meanness. I mean, I guess it is kind of, but but it's the real me. It's the it's the whole me. It's the it's the divine aspect that starts to awaken to what the truth really is, which is that we are never born, we never die. Um, everything is is fine. There's no issue, right? And and when I've been in that state, and sometimes amongst others that that are in this sort of awakened state, it's amazing what happens because. There's no mind aspect to it. There's not an intent. I mean, maybe you can bring an intention, but it's not like there's a doing. It just starts happening. These these things unfold. And sometimes the, the body is, is able to just naturally move. Um, and I've just witnessed both personally and with others, this amazing stuff that happens. That, again, it's almost hard to put words to. Again, we can only describe it from our sort of ego mind, right? And we try to label it and try to, to, to figure out what, what it really is, but I don't even what, think we can. No, what if we allow ourselves to be sufficiently selfless to not bring any intention in? What if instead we allow ourselves to recognize that it's awareness, that just as the sun's light, as Rupert Spire would say, just as the sun's light allows things to be visible, consciousness allows things to be known. Consciousness allows itself to be known through our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations. And it's not a thought. It's not a feeling. It's not a sensation. So how does that play? Let's play for a minute. Ready? What? One, two? Yeah, absolutely. You want to say something first? Yeah, well, go ahead. I'll, I'll ask afterwards. Take a second. Okay. Take one hand for me. Open your fingers like that. Okay, good. Now, don't let them move. Okay, hold them still. You want to hold them a little stronger? You can. When I'm here, I'm not sending anything to you. I'm receiving. I'm feeling. Now, you can look directly at your hand, not in the camera, but actually look at your hand. As I play, you feel nothing or you feel something? I can feel something. Can you describe it? Um, it's like a sort of a pulsing sensation in my palm. Mm -hmm. Now your fingers have started to curve in a little bit again. So open them back up. Hold them still and watch them. Are they still? Or do you see movement? It's a little bit of movement. Okay. Now let me move a little further away. Uh, not even I can see that. Are you watching your hands? Yeah. Okay. So hold them still. Just do whatever it takes to hold your fingers still and watch them. Okay. Tell me when they're still. They're still. Okay. And now? Well, I can just, I can feel my palm like pretty significantly. Uh -huh. And they're feel coming it. in. <laughs> they're coming in a little. I'm having to like consistently pull back. And they're, they're moving in. So, so, so let your hands down. What the hell is that that I'm doing over here? Where, where are you right now? I'm in San Diego. Okay. And I was there a week or two ago, but now I'm outside of Chicago. What the hell is happening? Is that in my receiving, you're receiving because there is no distance, time, and space. Now, we hear these words all the time. And that's a problem because we get used to them. It's like the Hallmark greeting cards and, and the t-shirts that say love. We get used to them. We are one. We get used to that. How about saying, what does that really mean? What does that really mean that someone in the middle of the country can just allow themselves to receive and suddenly I'm receiving? That a little play is having an interaction. What, what is going on? And I believe that part of the gift is allowing ourselves to not just say the words we've been told and we think that we should say, but to really receive the insight 
that we allow ourselves as we explore these concepts. Yeah, uh, one of the w- one of the tools that I like to use in, in this similar type of awareness work is is to bring in curiosity, because uh, it to me it doesn't feel like a doing. It just feels like I'm here and I'm curious, and that allows me to to be informed by something, right? And usually it's this wild, intuitive knowing that comes in when I'm in that sort of open, curious state. Right. And so where we get caught up in is a lot of us go to explore through teachers. And teachers teach us techniques to access this and we go but this is only a technique so we can get to this point fine but when do we let go of the technique how about in that moment how about if it's all about play and receiving and we let go of that and then, and then we'll say well yes but if i let go of the technique how will i honor my teacher you know what if we're learning from teachers they may not necessarily feel so honored if you release the technique. If we are gaining greater cognizant awareness through interaction with masters, they'll realize that that's the only way we can honor them. They're releasing anything that even remotely feels like a technique. So when we teach reconnective healing all of our phenomenal teachers that we have around the globe over a hundred thousand people so far easily have learned reconnective healing will say here's one way you may notice this here's something else you may notice this here's a concept that may allow you to notice this here's a way to tune into certain sensations that may allow you to notice this but the point is Techniques like experience, every experience is finite. An experience by virtue of being an experience has a beginning, a middle, and end. Even the experience of being human has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But you, Jason, are infinite. You began before this human experience. You'll continue afterwards. So I'd be somewhat hesitant of any teaching that tells you to continue doing the technique, do it three times a day for 30 days or for nine months or meditate for this length of time for this long or train your brain to this. Or How about, here's a way you may notice something. Now, when you walk out this door, leave it inside the room because it's only the infinite us. So we can teach ways to access cognizant awareness, but really in that comes the glimpse. That one glimpse of the infinite, which then automatically sets off a series of glimpses of the infinite. And then we become more and we don't become because we already are. See, we don't really have exactly words, but we bring the infinite more and more into our everyday lives. Here's the gift. So we say, well, now we're going to have a group healing and we're going to have 12 people getting together to send one intention to someone else. Well, really? Already, what's happening when you've got 12 people sending one intention? Well, first of all, it's an intention. So if the best you can hope for is getting that intention, does that mean you understand the mind of God or the bigger picture? Do you know that that's the right thing in the overall for that person? And yeah, 12 of you. So is that person receiving 1,200% of a healing? Well, you can't really have 1,200%. The reason for the word or the term 100% is because that's it. So if there are 12 of you, are you each giving that person one twelfth of their healing? Then you've reduced yourself. And in that holographic experience of 12 people giving one twelfth, 
Are they even getting 100%? No, they're only getting one twelfth at best anyway because of the 12 peoples of sin, the other 11 away. To go facilitate healings for others and you become 100%. And if you are 100% in the infinite, then you know. Your knowingness understands that the healing is not to be directed. Who are we to point up to the heavens and shake a finger and say, this person needs this healing on their knee right over there, and I'm going to bring my hands forward and direct it. And direct it, how about if we're willing to say, I'm here because not just I am facilitating healing, but because I am. Not what follows, I am I angry, I'm hungry, I'm facilitating healing, but I am. In presence, we become not a conduit. We, a straw is not needed to blow the healing into a person. Our presence is a catalyst, allowing for enhanced greatness because we are willing to receive and our ego and the personality is willing to step out of the picture and say, say, I knew what healing they needed. And I directed it over there because I'm so wonderful. It's a real challenge. The ego in the healing world is such a huge challenge because everyone walks around saying, yes, I've released my ego. You, however, need to release your ego. And I know this because I've released mine and I can see in yours that yours is still there. And we're going, what? Something's not working there, is it? Yeah, I, I love what you're saying because it's, it, it, I mean, I came from sort of the functional medicine, integrative medicine world, similar to chiropractic, right? And, and there's a real doing uh, with that type of healing and there's a real knowledge base and you're taking all your skills and, and you're applying them to the person and you really fi figuring out what they need. And, you know, I mean, look, there's some pretty good again, chiropractors and functional medicine, and integrative people out there, no question. And they can, they have some good tools and also they're not perfect and um things don't work out uh and and they don't get results all the time and so I, and i know this even for some of the best people um and so it's just funny because i was in search of a better way right to to really serve people and what i woke up to was was exactly what you're talking about which was that the only way is to essentially learn quote unquote to step aside to get out of the way and and allow this this natural way of being to to emerge and when i can get to that space there's a real again I, my ego is still very present <laughs> and there's this there's this aspect of like i don't know what i'm doing um and, and so that's still there a little bit where it's like uh, there's a fear of, of huge exactly our willingness to not know and to admit that we don't know because of that we are open yeah when we say we know we close we put everything into a box listen how do you know when you're talking with someone who doesn't know anything the more detail they give you with the more sure. certainty <laughs> they give you the quicker it's time to say thanks was lovely gotta go you know, and, and we're talking about all these healing professions, medicine and osteopathy and everything. They're all wonderful. That is their approach to come in, to evaluate, to diagnose, to treat, to give therapy. Treatment and therapy is based on symptoms and what you can determine and the limitation by the cognizant thinking human limited mind and then interpreted. Hopefully it's interpreted right or, or there wouldn't be the word misdiagnosed would there right. so because misdiagnosed is not the winner of a bathing suit contest it's a problem so um we're not doing as you said the healing we are the healing so do we really want to be looking outside of ourselves for more tools because who wants to be a tool <laughs> you know um when we are in the infinite beingness, we are, and that's where healing is. Reality is always perfect. The problem is the way it appears. This is how it looks. This is what we think it means. That becomes the limitation. 
So we start saying, well, it's just like this. Well, it's kind of like that. Well, it's kind of like something else. Well, really, it isn't. Because there is only one is. So it can't be like something if it's is. So it feels like something. It means that there's something that we're doing in that thing it feels like that we're still doing. Right. That's what we'd like to release. Yeah. It's, it, and it's always funny because when I can get to that place where I let go and I sort of step aside and, and sometimes my ego is freaking out over here and, and I'm still allowing, right? And, and, and what unfolds, which I have no idea what's, what's going to happen, um, when it happens or when things unfold and emerge, I'm always amazed afterwards. There's always this sense of awe, like what the heck is this, right? And it's, it's this amazement that, that it can happen without the me, that, that I'm so used to applying to the situation. Now notice how you, as you're speaking, a lot of we can see your shoulders moving like this, and every once in a while we'll see your hands come up and down. Why? Ever stop and think and realize your hands start talking before you do? Totally. We think we're going to use the mind, you know, mind over matter, body, mind. But there's more. The extended mind is what we sort of receive. We feel, we tune into it. It's not really the mind. It's the knowingness. So sometimes when we're working with healings, we're taught, well, move your hands three times counterclockwise or something, which gets confusing if you're on an airplane and you're crossing over the equator. <laughs> well, does it go the other way like the water down the toilet? But um, when we let go of the shoulds and the shouldn'ts, move this way, not that way, don't cross over here, start with this hand, start with it. We find we naturally move into what outwardly appears to be gesture, gesturing, but this is really us listening with a different sense, feeling, receiving, listening. It's the beingness that lets us tune in. And in that presence, when we can be facilitating a healing for someone halfway around the world or in the same room we're in, or when we're simply looking to receive for ourselves or understand something or write that paper and when our ideas are sticking this kind of a movement sometimes just allows us to receive beyond the cerebral and there is the communication the sharing the oneness again the healing our knowingness of this is the healing our willingness to go yeah i'm following this wonderful Method, we're coming up with another word for technique, let's say, but I don't want to quite use the T word. Um, and this is helping me be free without technique and intention. If I do this, uh, 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 catch that. If I do it this way, so don't. Don't do anything you've ever been told you're supposed to do when you want to receive a healing or facilitating a healing, especially that one thing you know for certain you should do. Don't do that. See what happens. The worst thing could happen is you'll die and then you'll be all right anyhow, right? <laughs> if not, we'll have let go of one cognizant fear. And every time we let go of one cognizant fear, a thousand and one fears we're not even aware of disappear with it. We let go of one conscious fear a week. By the end of the year, 52,000 fears walk away. And healing is love. It's not fear. It doesn't exist that way in fear so sometimes we have to walk through these fears to discover the light that we've always been so we've been giving ourselves little padded steps along the way hmm. we don't need those steps to experience that truth shines for us as love beauty reality who and what we are. And that's where we are in the healing world. And it doesn't come from the following steps and the doing. It's a luminal understanding. Mm. It's a beingness of light. Now, one of the things I've experienced as I started to become aware of awareness and, 
and and the ability to shift into a, a higher state, so to speak, and allow is that I got better at feeling. And I mean, both somatically in the body, um, I was able to tune into the feeling sensations better. And also, um, I, it's hard to even explain, but, but non-somatic pers- the subtle perceptions that are very hard to even put into words of, but all I can say is that it's a feeling, some sensation, some awareness of, of something that I was tuned in, that I was able to start tuning into. And I learned to cultivate that a finer and finer resolution, so to speak, of those feelings and sensations. And I'm curious, and it's not something that I try to do um, when I kind of do, do work with people, but it's something that naturally got cultivated. And I'm curious what your experience is, are, is with, with sensation and how important or not important that might be to, to kind of this, this whole healing experience that you, that you work with. You know, healing is the taste, let's say, as, as Rupert Spire would say, of our shared being. It's, it's a simplicity and the recognition that we are one. Even in this interaction, you might find an awareness of sensation that plays somewhere else in your body that correlates. Is that sort of what you're talking about? Right. Is yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it just naturally appears. I'm, I'm, I'm right. feeling perhaps what they're feeling. Perhaps it's something totally different, but, but it comes up, and it's there's a there's usually an awareness, a a, a recognition, a, an intuitive grasp of of what it means. It's like I'm not even trying; it just naturally appears, and it Got generally it. reveals something. So, what if we let go of intuition? And I'm hearing people gasping who haven't even watched this show yet. And what if we allow ourselves to be more in the knowingness of instinct? Because instinct is over here. Thought is over here. Intuition is instinct clouded or obscured by thought, by judgment, by a bit of the ego. Well, my instinct is telling me, you know, all of a sudden- There's an interpretation to it. Right. Um, And these- sensations and we already talked about this earlier in this inter, inter, interaction we're having here in this interview they didn't just show up your awareness of them decided to tune into that right so healing is the taste of our shared being our shared being is not only with others but is with us that's why we get feedback within us Ultimately, and it's funny because I'm saying what I know you already know, is that there are no others. When we receive, we're receiving healing. We're receiving love. It's our shared being. So we don't have to send the healing with our to our mother also because we wanted to have the healing. We're receiving. She's receiving. The people we like, they're receiving. The people who might need something that we thought about earlier, they're receiving. The people we don't like and the people we absolutely abhor, well, guess what? They're receiving just as much the same anyway, because being one, we don't get to pick and choose and cordon off. And as we allow that awareness to tune in, that that is the excitement. That is the freedom. That is part of when Jillian and I are teaching and we're sharing, it is about that recognition, these discoveries that come when we're not trying to find them, because you can't try, because trying is an effort which forces them away. It's when it's, it's like when someone's feeling pain or discomfort in a healing situation. It's not because of the healing. It's because there's something unknown that they're resisting. It's the resistance that they're feeling. So guess what? Healing is simply the recognition that we are one. Love is simply the recognition that we are one. And you know what the biggest challenge of all of this is? Hmm. The simplicity. Hmm. Because the simplicity does not feed the ego. And the ego is very hungry all of the time for fear that if it's not fed, it won't exist. And we have to say that's all right. Mm -hmm. 
we have to learn to say, that's all right. Simplicity is what makes this complicated because it is the challenge. It is the nature of things. Intelligence is the nature of consciousness when it's perceived by the finite mind, but we are infinite and in steeping in the reconnected healing experiences, people come in, they experience, they come out with it. Oh my God, I don't know where this was, but that is the infinite that we are. So we're really finding ourselves. Could this be better if I add this bell or this whistle? No, you can't make the infinite more. Yes, but when I add this, then you reduce it from being infinite. And the ego goes, no, no, because I'm going to add this new way to it and make it even more special. Let go. Yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of what I, what I kept hearing was it's this it's stripping away. It's letting go of all the conditioning, of all the crap that we think that we've been taught that we want to make true and, and get down to the core of what is truth. Simple. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because I think about, you know, a lot of your work is teaching this, I'm going to say technique, and I'm going to say teaching. Why don't we others. say approach? How about sharing <laughs> well, insight into a healing approach? Well, well I, I kind of like using yeah, those, those, those false terms because that's probably what most people come in thinking, that they're going to, quote unquote, learn a technique and perhaps if they've seen you speak or what have you they, they they already recognize that's that's not the case but i think still most people because unless they shut the volume off when i was talking <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but i think even still people hear those words and yet they come in expecting to learn a technique or a method right because it's it's really hard to to think otherwise because it, it almost doesn't make sense to our to our ego mind that we're going to basically unlearn uh, things, everything, so to speak, and get down to the core. So, so maybe just give me a, a little preview or an insight. Like, what is it? How do you go about unteaching, so to speak? I don't know fully that we do that either. Okay. <laughs> I believe what happens is it's revelation. It's revealing. I don't want to say revelation. It sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 Careful with that. Or an unveiling. I, I hate to say unveiling too. It sounds like something happens at a cemetery. But it is an unveiling. It's a revealing of our soul. It's a dipping into the infinite experience. And once we do that and really allow ourselves to absorb that infinite, we don't want to try to cram it back into a finite window frame of a technique or a method. But it's a recognition that comes to us. And does it, does it happen through transmission? Does it happen through kind of pointing awareness so that awareness can find these truths? Or how do you essentially accomplish I might go. I might go towards a little bit of pointing or directing awareness, helping people to find and discover. It can't be a transmission because then that would have to be sent. Mm. And then we're back into the illusion of distance, time, and space. And I thought it was a transmission. I really did. Yeah. But it came from somewhere. I knew I could feel for it. I could find it. I could stretch it. And we will still teach people how to do that in the beginning because it allows for that knowingness. And then knowingness becomes greater knowingness. Yeah. And then it is no longer needed. It's kind of like the concept of love is the dissolution of a separation between two people. That's why when we say I love you, we're not really being accurate. You can't love you because it's a delicious, it's a dissolution of the separation. So you can't heal someone because healing is the dissolution, the dissolving of that separation between two people. We enhance that illusion of separation more when we get involved into trying to do group healings, because now we're telling ourselves I'm less, I'm, I'm more if I have 11 other people working with me. So without them, I must be and look that blank can't be filled it with any other word, but less. So we see ourselves that way and we bring through that way. 
And we're taught that way. And the ego likes to say, I am healing you. When we touch this, and in the reconnective healing training programs, the seminars, what we do, you experience this in a way. I mean, look, on the first day, most people's faces are like, like, is that really happening? My favorite are the couples who come in. You clearly know which one wanted to come and which one was dragged by the excitement from the unexpected change of what's going on. Um, the, the alchemy, the transmuting of an understanding. It's a change in life. It's not, where can I go next weekend for the next technique? It's sort of about, I found me. Yeah. The infinite me, and I am so in love. I not even in love. I am love that I didn't realize that I was. And then we start to experience the I beyond the finite, smaller I into the I of I am. And, and experiencing that, just as you were telling me earlier, there are really no words. Feel how I'm stretching for these words. And I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so many people and answer that at each time we're finding the words because if I memorize what line says it best, I'm not present. As soon as we start using all those rote little lines, I'm running energy, I'm sending it here, I'm, you know, what whatever it is that we've heard, don't say it. If you've heard it said before, Find new words because that reaching inside of you to discover more is discovering more for you. That is our healing, which clearly you can tell. I don't have an opinion on the subject. Yeah, I know. I love it. And, and that's been my most powerful lessons. And and look, I I really came from a school of mind. You know, I, I, I was good in school. I was pretty clever. I could figure things out. And so I really, really relied on that faculty to get me through life. And it wasn't until I started learning some of this awareness-based teaching, so to speak. In other words, my teachers would use their awareness to guide my own awareness to an experience. And, and that was a real wake-up call because something like presence, right? We can talk about that all day long and the mind understands what presence is, kind of right? We, we, we cognitively grasp what presence is. It, it right? gets, it gets the, the spoken theory of it because it's recitable, but does right. it really in any way grasp what it is? I, I, I yeah, it, it has totally, so far outside the mind. It can't. Right. And, and, and my first experience with what I would call presence I, I thought, oh wow, that's what presence is. Like I, 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 I know it because I directly experienced it. Nobody told me, nobody taught me. I directly experienced it. And then later, I had a deeper or more present experience of presence. And I thought, wow, that's even somehow more present than my last experience. And so when I realized these things. Um, same thing with love, same, whatever you want to experience, there's a deeper, more whole, more real, more direct, like it, it keeps going deeper. And I thought, wow, this is, nobody could have told me or taught me this because it doesn't make sense that if I experience presence, then I'm present. But then I thought, no, I can be more present somehow. I can be deeper in presence. And that that was a real wake up call. So it really taught me that direct experience is the ultimate teacher. And, and again, even I can share these words and it still doesn't really, nobody can really understand what I mean unless you've had that experience. And that's why we explain that reconnective healing is the direct path to healing. It, it just, there are not turns, it's a direct path. And our only little detours along the way, sometimes on the direct path, is looking to find words in the experience of the borderless. It's so borderless in the experience you described. I know your personality wasn't there. The personality wasn't there. The personality is the flavor of the finite mind. It is the ego, and it wasn't there for that. 
No, the per personality was shocked. It was like, what the heck was that? You know, it was like trying to figure out what just happened and how that's possible. Like the, the, the ego is just always surprised. Right. I love that. This is our healing. And people go, why are you talking about ego? You know, I thought we were going to be talking about healing. Well, this is the healing because in the experience of this, we are receiving, everyone is receiving with, the, with the, the resonance of the energy, the light, the information that is of the reconnective healing experience, everything that obscures, that blocks, that limits this recognition vibrates out of the picture, falls away, dissolves, disappears. And then suddenly we realize that what we've been seeing is the world that the world itself is an illusion that only awareness is real and that's who we are. And in that, we receive our healings. In that, we facilitate healing. And healing is not even in the finite, limited way that we tend to think of it, regaining the use of an arm or a leg or your, your eyes or nice but it's not about coming back to where you are. It's not a return because in that there's no infinite, there's no further, there's no more. Healing is about more. It's a different word. We've been confusing healing with fixing something that got broken and bringing it back to where it was before it was broken. Right. It's, it's it's so much more and therefore it is as you explained so beautifully the experience it is shared and discovered revealed and unveiled in the experience in the energy in the light in the information which is what you and i shared when we played with our hands but what but it wasn't just then. In this entire communication, you will receive probably from people who watch this and listen to it and interact, even though they realize cognizantly that this happened before they're watching it, not at the same time. It doesn't matter. There will be transformation going on and you will hear about it. My body was vibrating. I felt this in my hand. This was happening. That was happening. And why? And we're going to smile and say, like we said, Time, space, distance is all an illusion. This is not it. Look, when, when I wrote the book, The Reconnection, my editor would call me every once in a while um, from Hay House and say, I can't edit this book. I said, why? She goes, because every time I pick it up, my hands start vibrating and I have to put it back down. <laughs> so let's move a little past that. Now, when you read The Reconnection, it was written in more of a dual this and that language, more of a duality, because I was talking about it from the way I recognize it, there are amazing insights and understandings that we understand. And I believe we need to acknowledge the duality, the appearance that my microphone is over here in front of me and my computer is over there further away. Yes, that exists to a certain level. We also are here to allow the unveiling, the revealing of the non-duality of the oneness of the unity that we are there in lies our healing and my healing is yours and yours is mine. Right. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's a big one for me too, um, was recognizing that there's a, there's a bothness to all of this, right? You, you are clearly way far away from me. Your body's way far away from me. Right. I, and yet we are one, we are connected, we are not separate in any way from an awareness perspective. So recognizing the, the both and aspect of, of sort of this weird duality and the oneness at the same time, if we can hold both, um, then magic starts to unfold and, and we really start to recognize because I think before I, I really was able to grasp that, that concept, it was this, it was more ethereal. It wasn't, it wasn't a true recognition of, of the real connection and oneness that is, that is present uh, always and forever. And it was the never, and never. It was the t-shirt. It was the cup that said the words, but 
it's the glimpse of our true nature that is the key to our healing. Right. It's what reaches out to us and brings us in and then allows that to go on with everyone else until we recognize there's no such thing as else. Right. There is no everyone else. There is no yeah. everyone yeah. else. I love this. Well, Dr. Eric Pearl, this has been a fantastic conversation. I absolutely loved it. Tell people where, where they can find more of your work. Well, um, our website is thereconnection.com. You have to use the word the, thereconnection.com. The book is called The Reconnection. Heal Others, Heal Yourself. There's a new book coming out. There's one in the interim also you can find called Solomon Speaks on Reconnecting Your Life. Um, training programs are international, so you can find them on the reconnection.com or with our partnership Reconnective Academy, which is based um, in Europe. So most of the training programs around the globe are taught in English and the language of the country, but not all of them. So, so read the insights into there and, you know, click your heels three times. Where do you, where do you have to go? You have to go nowhere. And yet there's so much to be gained from the interaction. So um, the training programs to access the reconnective healing experience, and we call it the experience because it is the experience, a finite experience of the infinite is transformational to quote you, Jason, beyond words. Mm. Beautiful. I love it. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate our conversation. It was great to get to know you and how you think and how you really uh, do this work. It's, I, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Before we start the next interview, please take just a second to think about who do you know that needs this information? By sharing the Global Energy Summit with others, you could change or even save someone's life. So, Please click the share button below the video to help us spread the word and empower your friends and loved ones with this empowering health information. I am so excited about our next guest. He's got a, a million watt smile, which you're going to, he's starting to unleash it right now. You're, you'll see it if, if he's not coming up right now. But uh, he has become actually somebody that I, I really have, have grown to to, to love. Like, I love this guy. I love being around him. He's just got such great energy. And his name is Cyrus Kambata, and he's a PhD in, in uh, actually, what are you a PhD in, uh, it's Cyrus? In, it's in super nerd. It's called nutritional biochemistry. Nutritional biochemistry. And he got his undergrad degree at Stanford, which is quite a feat in itself. And then he went to Cal, another great school to get his PhD. And I, I'm gonna hack. I'm gonna actually have him tell the story. But and I'm I'm curious if you were always interested in this. But when he was in Stanford, he, you know things were probably going pretty well. And then all of a sudden, you know the Global Energy Healing Summit. He his energy wasn't there, and ended up finding out that he had diabetes and type one diabetes, not type two diabetes. I mean, you look at him now; he's incredibly healthy and fit but he figured out a way to master diabetes. And he's sharing that with the world, thank God, because so many people still think you get diabetes, you're a victim of it, you know, yeah. you can't live a, a healthy and full life. And not only is he sharing it with people, but he's sharing it by his example of actually doing that. So we'll dive into that a little bit too. I do wanna explore that a little bit, Cyrus. But Perfect. Cyrus, welcome to our summit. I know you're going to help a lot of people with not just diabetes, but with chronic illness or not enough energy as we delve into to the discussion today. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. You know, when we were first talking about the Global Energy Healing Summit, um, I thought it would be kind of fun to talk about energy from the like biochemical perspective, because a lot of the times when people refer to energy, uh, they don't, it has many different forms, you know, we kind of like, how much energy do you have? Like how much mental energy do you have? How much emotional energy do you have? How much physical energy do you have? But from a biochemical perspective, there's like a very clear description of like, what is energy and how is energy created? How is energy used? Which tissues are responsible for using it? How does the food you eat affect your energy levels and beyond? So, you know, if you, if you want to geek out on a bunch of fun stuff, we can definitely do that today. 
we'll definitely have we'll definitely have some fun. And you got Mr. Energy right behind you, Albert Einstein. You know, That's E. Right. My man. Where, which basically we interpret it to energy. E equals everything. Everything's energy. So exactly. what we eat's energy. Our thoughts are energy. Everything. So go back to Stanford. I think was it your senior year where you started having these issues. And, and uh, tell us a little bit about what happened. And also, I'm curious, when you talk about it, did that, did that really shift your course into the, you know, the realm of, of what you're doing now? Not just the, the, the diabetes, obviously, it, it, it shifted you in that way, but really studying the, you know, the, the, the food and, and, and getting into the PhD level of, of that was that something you're already on the course to or did the situation that happens that you're gonna describe did that put you on the course to it great question great question okay so if we go way backwards in time uh when i grew up uh, my mom always used to refer to me as you know the the son that or the the, the kid that she just couldn't tame you know <laughs> i was the the third of three kids i have two older sisters and i remember what it used to feel like to be you know three years old five years old seven years old where like I would wake up in the morning and I was just I was just a hellcat. I mean I was just running around doing all types of stuff. I'd play baseball, I'd play soccer, I'd play basketball, I'd, I'd do running, I'd go swimming. And so my mom's objective at that point in my life was just to put me into every single sport that was available, so that by the time I got home, I was relaxed. And it worked because I would go play baseball, then I would go to basketball practice, and I just developed this love of sport from a very young age, right? So, you know, that was normal to me, to be always active, to be performing some kind of physical activity and to really be sort of like competing in a fun way. So by the time I got to college, this was like, you know, 18 to 22, um, 18, 19, 20, I was still active, I was still lifting weights, I was still playing soccer. And then by the time I hit 22 years old, I noticed there was just a fundamental shift in the way that I felt. And uh, I couldn't explain exactly why. So this is like November of 2002, and I'm sitting there and I'm studying for finals and I'm like trying to go through, I was studying mechanical engineering at the time and I'm trying to like learn thermodynamics and you know, physics and trying to really apply myself. And there, there came this point in one day when I was sitting there studying that I just, I kept on like, I kept on falling asleep and I was like, whoa, like what is going on? This is, this is very weird. And in addition to that, I noticed that my thirst was insatiable. I mean like, I've definitely been thirsty in my life, but this was a whole different level of thirst, right? So what I would do is I would drink a glass of water, put it down, and then I would continue studying. And I, would, I was like, wow, I think I'm thirstier, like thirstier than I, than I was five minutes ago. I drink another glass of water, put it down. I was like, I think my thirst is growing, right? Then I went and got some Gatorade thinking, well, maybe I'm electrolyte depleted. So I put some Gatorade in and before I knew it, I was like, oh my Lord, like what is going on? My thirst is growing and I'm getting more tired, right? And so because I was taking on so much liquid, I would then go start urinating frequently. So I was urinating like literally every 30 minutes like clockwork. And so um, I picked up the phone and I called my sister and she is a doctor of osteopathy and she's a family practice physician and she is mind bogglingly smart. Mm -hmm. And so I picked up the phone and I said, Hey, Shanaz, can you help me out? Um, here's my symptomology. This is what I'm experiencing. Do, have you ever heard of this before? And she's, she's as cool as a cucumber under pressure. And she, she started crying immediately. And she was like, Cyrus, drop everything that you're doing right now, go straight to the health clinic. And I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on? And she said, you're explaining that you have type one diabetes. Those are all the telltale symptoms of it. Uh, this is a very, you know, can be a very dangerous situation. I don't want you to freak out, but just go. So I went straight to the health center. They checked me in. They checked my blood glucose because they know the warning signs as well. And, and my blood glucose, you know, your normal physiological blood glucose is between approximately 70 and 130 on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So if I were to check your blood glucose at any moment in the day, before you ate food, after you ate food, it doesn't matter. Your blood glucose would be usually within that window, okay? Now, at that moment, my blood glucose was in the 680s. Wow. I mean, we're talking like a whole different, it was six times higher than it was supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I didn't know any of this language. I didn't know what blood glucose was. I didn't know anything about human biology. I didn't know anything. I just was like, uh, should I be worried? And they were like, listen, we're going to take you straight to the hospital. Took me to the hospital. 24 hours later, I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Mm. So in the hospital, they gave me you know, IV fluids. They gave me a drip irrigation of insulin. And the whole purpose was to try and figure out what had gone wrong. And while I was there, they, di they diagnosed me with three autoimmune conditions. So the first one was actually called 
Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which is becoming very more, more prevalent in today's world. So that's an autoimmune dysfunction of your thyroid gland, which decreases your thyroid hormone output. That's number one. The second one is called alopecia universalis, which is basically saying hair loss. And so as you can see, I used to have hair, but I don't have any hair. I have no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no ear hair, nose hair. I got nothing on me. And at that time, I was losing my hair, and they recognized that I actually had alopecia. And then in addition to that, they said, you also have type 1 diabetes. Three autoimmune conditions wow. back to back to back. And yeah. I was like, whoa, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? <laughs> like, am I eating incorrectly? Am I, am I stressed out too much? Am I drinking too much beer? Like, what, what is the problem here, right? Yeah. And so nobody has the answer to that question, even to this day. Nobody can pinpoint exactly why I developed type 1 diabetes or Hashimoto's or alopecia. That answer still is, un, it, that's still unanswered. Mm -hmm. Point being is that um, that set me on the path to trying to figure out how to become a healthier individual, right? So for the first year of living with type 1 diabetes, I followed the recommendations of the medical uh, world, that, which is to eat a low carbohydrate diet. So it was 2002 and the recommendation was eat a low carbohydrate diet because a low carbohydrate diet will help you lower your blood glucose It'll help you l use less insulin and your, your life with diabetes, with type 1 diabetes, will just be easier. Period. End of story. So I was yeah, like, okay, low, low, carb low carbohydrates. So you're, you're eating mostly protein or what are you eating then? Yeah. So what you're eating in a low carbohydrate setting is you're eating lots of – you're eating red meat, white meat, chicken, fish, dairy products, um, you know, lean meats, whatever that really means, yeah. plus things like – peanut butter and, um, you know, olive oil. And what you're trying to reduce your intake of is things like breads and yeah. pastas and cereals, as uh -huh. well as fruit, as well as potatoes. So I refer to those as being more like whole carbohydrates, the fruits and the sure. potatoes. Yeah, yeah. And they're telling you to, re you lower your refined carbohydrate intake as well. So yeah. by doing that, you're eating less carbohydrate, which means that your blood glucose value will become more stable. And as a result of that, you can probably get away with using less insulin. So that was the promise. But it didn't work for you, right? Not even close. I mean, <laughs> I, Tom, I wish I had my blood glucose meter from back in the day. I wish I had the data because my blood glucose was a total disaster. And again, blood glucose is supposed to be relatively well controlled between about 70 and 130. If you're living with type 1 diabetes, they say 70 to 180 to account for just a little bit of human error. But it was such a struggle to keep my blood glucose within that window that on any given day, my blood glucose could be as low as like a 40, which is like a very uncomfortable and potentially life-threatening situation. Yeah. And as high as like a 340, wow. right? So I was literally like ping-ponging up, down, up, down, up, down. And when you do that, it really takes a toll on your emotions, it takes a toll on your mental health, and it takes a toll on your physical health as well. So within a year of, of eating a low carbohydrate diet, my glucose was relatively uncontrollable. My insulin use was creeping up over the course of time. It started at like 25-ish units per day and went north of 45 to 55 units per day. How frustrating was that? Like you're doing everything they're telling you and it's not working, right? Yeah, I mean, it was frustrating, honestly. It was so frustrating that I was like, I remember coming home from work one day, checking my blood glucose, doing everything right. I played a game of soccer in the middle of the day. I went to the gym and I lifted weights and I was eating exactly the way that I was told. And I come home to check my blood glucose before dinner because I'm excited to eat dinner and I'm looking for a number that's between 70 and 130 and I get a number of 286. Oh, and I picked up my blood glucose meter and I looked at the wall and I threw it against the wall as hard as I possibly could and it just shattered. And then I fell onto the couch and I started crying and I was like, there has got to be an easier way. This is, this is dumb. This, it should not be this way. So that is what set me on the path to answer your question. That's what set me on the path to trying to learn more about human nutrition, to trying to learn about how I could uh, apply a sort of more evidence-based approach to gotcha. my own personal health, and then also to try and find a way to eventually help other people that are also going through either type 1 diabetes or pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Gotcha. And so long story short, I went back to – I changed my diet to becoming fully plant-based. Mm. So I went from eating a low-carbohydrate 
diet to eating 100% nothing but fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And um, my blood glucose became so controllable so quickly that it was like, I almost didn't believe it. Okay, so my blood glucose used to be ping-ponging all day long and by you know eating a plant-based diet, all of a sudden my blood glucose came down my insulin use came down very quickly. I'm talking about a 40% reduction within the first week, which is a big wow. deal wow. in the world of type one. And I had more energy. I was more hydrated. Uh, I, my sort of like anxiety about type one diabetes and the, the, the depression that I was living with at that time tended to just kind of go away. And um, I felt like a million bucks. Yeah. yeah. So I then put myself back to graduate school to go get a PhD in nutritional biochemistry so that I could really learn the like nitty gritty, super nerd scientific details to try and answer a simple question, which is, am, am I a freak of nature? Meaning is what happened to me uh, like an N of one story or is what happened to me something that's actually described in the medical literature and can this also be applied to other people? And in the process of going through graduate school and reading thousands of papers, it became very obvious to me very quickly that number one, there's, there's literally almost 100 years of scientific information that demonstrates the power of eating a high carbohydrate slash low fat diet that is rich in plants. And that research dates back all the way to the 1920s. Wow. Um, so that's number one. And then number two, what I was experiencing not only had been described in the literature, but it had actually been described in people living with prediabetes and type two predominantly. Yeah. And so if you look at that information, you go, okay, great. This could be a potential solution to uh, the sort of epidemic of diabetes that we're experiencing right now. And what's even cooler is that this way of eating not only pertains to diabetes and blood glucose control, but it also is a very powerful cardiovascular health improving tool. It's mm. also a very powerful permanent weight loss tool. Yeah. It's also a very powerful microbiome changing tool. So as a result of that, I like to think of a plant-based diet that is truly low in fat as being a re very powerful solution to revert, reduce your risk for chronic disease and reverse many existing chronic diseases at the same time. Well, and even just uh, anti-aging and fitness, like, you know, you look like you're about 25 years old, 24 years old, but, <laughs> Thank but you. you're a little bit older than that, right? Yep, definitely. 41, oh, 41. Yeah, 41 years old. But you, I yeah. mean, you, you just, I mean, you're so fit and lean and, and a lot of that, I know you probably work out, but a lot of that is part of your diet also. Uh, you know, I, I think that your experience, as tough as it was and and, you know, explaining it, you know, we don't even get the depth of what it meant when you threw the glucose monitor against the wall and it shattered and you're crying in the couch. But it was those times that allowed you to really have the courage to venture beyond what everyone else was telling you what to do and really find the secrets. And right. you ended up you end up you ended up writing a book called Mastering Diabetes, which was a New York right. Times bestseller. You've done big summits like this where you've helped so many people. You've got coaching programs. So as tough as that time was, it, it was in the end uh, a gift for so many people that you went through that experience so you could learn how to help so many. Now, today we're going to we're going to discuss uh, maybe a little bit about diabetes, but we're going to go beyond that. We're going to be talking about energy and when you when you went to get your PhD in nutritional biochemistry, you really were studying energy. Everything's energy, food's energy, cells are energy, everything's energy. Give us a look or some insight into the biochemistry energy uh, of energy inside every single one of us. What's going yeah, on? Great question. Okay, so a simple way to think about energy inside of a, uh, an organism, whether that organism is an amoeba, or whether it's a chicken or a cow or a duck or a raccoon or a human being or a whale. Um, cellular energy uh, from an organismal perspective, from a biological perspective, comes in the form of this, uh, of a compound known as ATP. Okay, so ATP is called adenosine triphosphate. Don't worry, it's not gonna be on the quiz. But the idea here is that ATP is literally the thing, the compound, that can be exploited, that it contains energy, such that when it is oxidized, it can then yield energy. And that energy is then used to power chemical reactions that then perform useful work. 
right? So the ATP is the currency of biological systems. If you don't produce enough ATP, there are consequences for that. If you overproduce ATP, there are consequences for that. If you consume a fuel that inhibits your ability to manufacture ATP, there are consequences for that, right? So you can really think of ATP as being basically the gasoline that enables a, a, an organism to exist either and, um, and thrive, yeah. right? Well, before you go further though, you said something interesting. So, and thank you, by the way, for explaining it. I didn't go to Stanford. So thank you for explaining or, or Cal and get, for explaining it in a way that I could understand it. So I appreciate oh, come it. Come on, you get you know, it. So many of us, well, we'll, well, you know, we need that, that, you know, a little bit lower level, but still really juicy. So thanks for that. But you said you, you're in trouble if you don't have enough. You also said you could have too much. So yeah. that's interesting because some, some people go, you know, I want more energy and, may, you know, maybe you think there's, you know, there's never enough you can have, but, but there, and I know that you'll address this later, but there's, there could be an issue if you have too much of it going on inside you too, right? Definitely. Definitely. So, um, yeah. a way to think about this is that, uh, your, okay. Your body as an example, okay. You are a human being and you have a certain rate of energy production inside of your body. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I refer to energy production, I mean a certain rate of ATP that's being oxidized in order to power chemical reactions in your body that, that enable you to be alive. Mm -hmm. So these ATP, uh, the ATP that powers these chemical reactions is required in order to operate your heart muscle, to operate your lungs, to operate neurons in your brain, to operate your eyes, to operate your sexual organs, to operate your liver, your kidney, your pancreas, you name it, okay? And then in addition to that, when you go and exercise, if you're gonna go outside and play a game of tennis as an example, you also have to have the ability to perform, uh, to, to use ATP that's stored either in your muscle or in your liver to power that physical activity as well, right? So a simple way to think about it is that there's basically three components of what enable you to uh, expend energy. In other words, your total energy expenditure is divided into three buckets. The first bucket is called your basal metabolic rate, your BMR, okay? And that refers to how much energy is required, how many calories does it take to power your body if you were just lying down flat on a table for 24 hours, okay? So your BMR is basically, what's, it's your basal metabolic rate, meaning how much energy does it take to just power Tom's body, period, end of story, okay? That's number one. Bucket number two is called your TEF or your thermic effect of food. And that refers to how much energy is required in order to digest the food that you're consuming, okay? Because when you consume food, there's actually energy required by your digestive organs to digest that food and then transport those nutrients to other tissues, okay? Mm -hmm. So you got your BMR, you got your TEF, and then you got your third one, which is called your activity. Okay, so if, again, if you're gonna go play a game of tennis, you're gonna go play basketball, you're gonna go run around, there's re energy required in order to operate your musculature at that point. So there's gonna be a certain number of calories that are required to move your hamstring muscle and move your glute and so on and so forth in order for you to be an active individual. Or if you're just gonna to go to the grocery store and buy some stuff and come back home, again, that's activity. We're still gonna to have to account for all of those, you know, the energy required to perform that action, right? So if you add together your BMR plus your thermic effect of food plus your activity, you'll get what's called your total energy expenditure. Now that total energy expenditure is a very important number. And I don't know what my total energy expenditure is right now at this moment in time. And chances are you probably don't know what yours is either. Most people aren't walking around with a calculator that says, okay, great, your total energy expenditure is this number. But for the sake of argument, what we could do is we could open up a calculator and we could make some assumptions and then we could do some calculations and figure out what your total energy expenditure is. So I'll give you a hazard a guess for you mm -hmm. based off of what I know about your lifestyle. I would say, uh, what, how old are you? 60 years old. 60 years old, okay, 60 going on 35. So your basal metabolic rate is probably somewhere in the, I would call it somewhere between 1400 and 1600 calories per day. So mm -hmm. let's just average it to be about 1500 calories per day. Okay. Thermic effect of food is going to be about 10% of the energy that you're consuming. So I'm going to put that at another 250 calories right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 1500 plus 250 and then your activity level, 
how many how many days a week do you exercise on a I do something every day you know it varies in intensity but i do something every day so seven days a week i'm doing something yeah okay and then like how many minutes per day are you exercising uh you know sometimes it's like qigong so it's not like super high intensity uh you know that could i could go like 30 45 minutes uh that cycling i do indoor you know we've got one of the indoor cycles here in the house so uh, probably 20, 25 minutes and then, you know, play pickleball sometimes for an hour. Or so it really varies, but not super high intensity. I'm not grinding out CrossFit. So more moderate okay. intensity type stuff. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So then, uh, based off of what you just said, I'm going to estimate your activity expenditure to be somewhere around 400 calories per day. Yeah. 400, maybe 500 calories. So if we add together 1500 plus 250 plus call it 500, that puts us at 2,250 calories per day. So that's the amount of energy that, that you're going to expend on a daily basis. Again, that's the ATP that's inside of your heart, your liver, your blood vessels, your muscles, you name it, is required in order to uh, power those calories that's going to operate your body, right? Um, so to answer your question here, how do you have overnutrition? How do you, how do you have too much ATP on you? Okay, How do you have too much fuel on you? Um, the... In an ideal world, what would happen is that if you're burning 2,250 calories per day, then you would ideally take on almost exactly 2,250 calories per day. And if you did, then the amount of energy that you're taking on is equi equivalent to the amount of energy that you're expending. And as a result of that, you would be in you know energy neutrality, mm -hmm. right? And that would be a good thing because that would enable you to remain weight stable. You would not gain weight. You would not lose weight. You would be energy neutral, right? But what happens in today's world is that due to refined and packaged and processed foods, due to foods that are extremely high in fat, due to processed meat consumption, due to dairy consumption, due to the consumption of just high calorie foods in general, what most people don't realize is that they actually consume more calories than their total ex energy expenditure. So for somebody else who might be living a sedentary lifestyle or somebody else who might be eating a very high fat diet or a diet that contains a significant amount of, uh, you know, animal based foods in it in, in general, they may be burning 2,250 calories per day, but they're taking on 2,900 calories per day. And yeah. so there's an energy surplus so that, you know, 650 calories of energy surplus has to go somewhere. Well, where does it go? Well, it goes into multiple locations. It goes into your adipose tissue, your fat tissue, okay? And it actually gets stored as excess fat, which can then lead to weight gain over the course of time. Some of that energy can get, actually get stored inside of your muscles as triglyceride. Some of that energy can get stored inside of your muscles as glycogen. Some of that can get stored inside of your liver as well as either triglyceride or glycogen. So point being is that your, your body can act as a Costco warehouse to take on the excess energy that you're putting into your mouth, right? Yeah. And then at the same time, the flip opposite happens as well, where your energy expenditure is 2,250 per day, but yet you're only taking on 2,000 calories per day, okay? And maybe that's because uh, you're highly stressed and you forgot to eat food, or maybe you're performing an intermittent fasting regimen, or maybe you're very, uh, you know, you're, I was gonna say, you're, you're, you're so active that you, it actually suppresses your appetite and that happens for some individuals. Yeah. So point being is that when there's an energy mismatch, when you're burning more than you're taking on, now there's an extra couple hundred calories which have to come from somewhere. Well, where does that come from? It comes from the tissue that you already have on your body. And so your, your muscle tissue in that situation ends up actually being catabolized and the amino acids that are inside of the muscle protein can get broken down and liberated from the muscle and then it gets sent to your liver to get converted into another fuel, oftentimes glucose, and that glucose is then used to actually power more chemical reactions, right? So point being is you can gain energy, you can lose energy, yeah. and it all depends on the balance between how much you're taking in and how much you're expending. That's fascinating. And when, so when someone is trying to lose weight, they are eating in a way and, and or e eating in a way where they are taking in less calories than they're burning. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, you've exactly explained right. it in a way that, that makes a lot more sense than I've ever thought about. So really, really cool. Uh, you talked about intermittent fasting and, and uh, I know that that's something you do, correct? So it's not something that I do. And the oh, reason okay. for that is because uh, my energy expenditure 
yeah. is like 3,400 calories per day, okay? And the reason it's 3,400 calories per day is because uh, I have a, a pretty darn high basal metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I also love to exercise. And my thermic effect of food is also a little bit higher than the average person. So if you put those three together, the sum total comes out to being 3,400. You need a lot of calories. You need to be eating them throughout the day. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I have to eat a significant amount of calories. And if I were to perform an intermittent fast and not eat food, I, it would be you know, health promoting for sure. Yeah. But I would end up sacrificing. I've tried this before. I end up losing weight and I don't want to lose weight. Right. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? That's a big topic right now. What do you, you know, what do you think about it? Yeah, intermittent fasting is actually one of the core principles inside of the, the, the method that we've developed specifically to help improve uh, blood glucose control, to mm -hmm. reverse the underlying cause of many chronic diseases called insulin resistance. And so yeah. we, I've read the literature on intermittent fasting. I literally did my entire graduate degree on it and it is, it is unbelievably powerful. It's more powerful than almost any other intervention that I can think of, right? So we are huge fans of it. And um, what, we, what we try and tell people uh, to do um, is to, you can, if you're a beginner at intermittent fasting, the easiest thing to do is perform a 24 hour intermittent fast for one day a week. So you just literally choose one day of the week where you're hopefully not gonna do too much exercise. And um, you would basically not eat food for 24 hours. So you would say like, let's say like, you would eat dinner on a Wednesday and then you would stop eating food right after your dinner. And then you would basically go to sleep, wake up on Thursday morning, skip breakfast, drink some water, drink some green tea, suppress your appetite a little bit, and then keep moving forward. Skip lunch. And then by the time you get to dinner time on Thursday, approximately 24 hours later, go ahead and eat some food again, right? And so that's a simple way to kind of get started with the process. But people who have done that multiple times and they really understand what it feels like to go without food for 24 hours, we then tell them to do a daily 16-8 intermittent fast where they're basically fasting for 16 hours and condensing their eating period to being about eight hours. So yeah. you can think of it as being like you start eating at noon and you finish eating at 8 p.m. Yeah. Right. So in that window, you can eat lunch, maybe you have a snack and then eat some dinner. Just don't overeat. Just eat a reasonable amount of food during that time. And then the rest of the time, you're, you're gonna fast. And what we've seen, not only from the literature, but also what we've seen in you know, having road tested this in thousands of, of people, is that when you perform an intermittent fast and you become a sort of habitual intermittent faster, uh, you would think that by going into an energy deprived state where you're, again, your, your total energy expenditure is now higher than your energy intake because you're skipping a meal you end up creating that calorie deficit, you would think that you would become very low energy. You would think that it would, uh, it would sort of like turn down the volume or turn down the thermostat inside of your body and you would sort of like, you know, you'd get tired, you wouldn't want to move your body as much, but um, the exact opposite happens. When I was in graduate school, we did a lot of experimentation using mice and rats because that's sort of the model that you use to test out many different things. And one of the things that we found every single time that we performed calorie restriction and or intermittent fasting on these animals is that the animals that ate less food were more active. <laughs> so we would go into feed them and the group that was eating that had access to an, you know, a buffet, all, all you can eat buffet, those animals were very sedentary. They were very lethargic. The animals that were calorie restricted were running around their cages and they were, they were like looking, they were foraging. And we, we, uh, hypothesized that it was because they were literally looking for their next meal. They were trying to figure out where they were going to get it, right? Yeah. But in human beings, that also same thing happens whereby restricting your calorie intake can lead to an increase in yeah. your feeling of having energy. And yeah. part of that is due to the fact that, you know, if you're losing a little bit of weight, it can relieve a little bit of the metabolic stress that's on your liver, that's on your muscles, that's on your heart. And as a result of that, you might just feel like you have more energy you might you know, become a little bit more mentally active and get rid of a lot of this sort of brain fog that people refer to and yeah. uh, just start to feel better, period, end of story. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a fan of it. I actually do it. I do, uh, I do the, you know, I don't eat till like, I don't, I don't usually wait till noon, but I ate a, a early dinner too. So sometimes I'm eating something at 10 if I've got like a lot of activity in the day, sometimes yeah. 11, but I, I don't eat past like 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. And it's amazing. And plus, you know, at age 60, it just does keep you nice and lean when, 
you know, I don't, might not have the metabolism of a youngster like you at 41. So <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it is amazing. The other thing it does too, is it changes your relationship mentally with food. Yes. Because, you know, I used to be, you know, they used to say, get up, have a good breakfast, right? And so the first thing you think about is, all right, what am I going to eat? And when, when I get up, I don't think about what I'm going to eat because I know I'm not going to eat right away. So I, I can do my, my, my Qigong, I can do my meditation, I can do my workout and, and just feel good. That's what I'm eating. I'm eating this workout or this, this Qigong practice. And uh, I, yeah, I, it really, the hard one to me is probably going a whole day, although I have done that. But, but a whole day for some people when they're just so used to just like thinking about the next meal, you guys getting them to do that, that's really powerful too. I love that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it definitely, there, it, it takes a sort of like at the beginning of the intermittent fasting process, it feels weird because most people haven't really deprived themselves of eating food for many years. But once you become used to it and you understand what it feels like to either become a little bit hungry or to become hangry, which happens to some people where they get a little bit like, you know, upset. Once you go through that process multiple times, you recognize, number one, uh, you're probably not going to die even though your brain likes to tell you that you are. Yeah. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. In fact, it's actually a extremely healthy way of being. Here, here's a, a fun calculation that we can do. Um, you're, you've probably heard this before where people say like, hey, how long do you think you can go without drinking water before you died, right? And how long do you think you can go without eating food before you died, right? And the truth is that you're going to have to drink some water before you eat some food, right? Yeah. And, you know, as far as water is concerned, the answer is probably somewhere between, you know, like four to seven days, you know, maximum. And at that point, you know, you don't have enough water, you get super dehydrated, like not compatible with life, right? But when it comes to food, okay, you can easily go 30 to 45 to 60 to 90 days without eating food. And no. most people think that that's not possible, that they would die by the time they hit the two week marker. But the truth is that it depends on how much mass you have on your body, how much tissue you have on your body. Okay? Yeah, most people think that they die if they hit the five hour marker. Desire. Right. <laughs> exactly right. So you can, yeah, you, the, mentally your brain is sort of conditioned in this world in which we live where you can get food anywhere at any time. Yeah. It kind of makes you feel like if you go three hours without food or six hours without food, that something bad is going to happen to you. But in reality, the exact opposite happens, which is it's actually better for you to eat less food. The last thing I'll say about this is that when, it, when we talk about uh, calorie restriction, uh, calorie restriction is literally the only known mechanism in, the, in all of biology to actually add time on this planet. Yeah. There is no other mechanism that, that science has discovered that can actually add years to your life, add time to your life. The only known mechanism that is repeatable and conserved amongst all species, not most species, everything from like yeast to worms to flies to rats to mice to dogs to sheep to monkeys to human beings is calorie restriction. So in other words, if you eat less food on a daily basis, like 20%, 25% less food, you actually will add time to the end of your life and you will, you will become a healthier individual and live a longer period of time. It's crazy. Love that. Hey, what do you say to people that say, well, if you just eat fruits and vegetables, you're not going to get enough protein? Yeah. Hogwash. <laughs> <laughs> Complete. That's what I like to call is like nutritional folklore. It's a fairy tale. It's, a, it's an absolute fairy tale. And the, where this originated actually was the idea that uh, pr uh, protein is nothing more than a, uh, a necklace that contains a bunch of amino acids. Okay, so the beads are these things called amino acids. There's 20 of them, approximately 20 of them, that you find in food, and they um, vary from protein to protein. So some proteins have more of specific types of amino acids and some proteins have less of specific types of amino acids. But the idea here is that when you consume foods that contain protein, then you get those amino acids and those amino acids then serve a biological function inside of you. Now, the truth is that uh, most people most people like to think, or at least on the blogosphere, 
uh, fruits and vegetables are thought of as containing either very low amounts of protein or no protein. And both of those are fundamentally incorrect assumptions. Mm. Okay? And in addition to that, meat and dairy products and animal products are thought of as being high protein. And that is a more true statement. And so the thought process goes, well, if you're not eating you know, animal-based foods and you're only eating plant-based foods, then your protein content is going to go down. And as a result of that, you're going to suffer. It's going to take a toll on your musculature. It's going to take a toll on your bone mass. It's going to take a toll on your bone mineral density. You might become osteoporotic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth is that the plant-based world uh, has plenty of uh, protein-rich foods in them. But more importantly, when you consume an animal-based diet, most of the time, the amount of protein that you're consuming is, is too much. So there is such a thing as, as consuming too much protein. Yeah. Okay? And uh, people who consume animal-based products generally cons- over-consume on protein. And people who consume plant-based foods uh, uh, you know, lower their protein intake. And there, there is a, a lot of people who consume too little protein. Right. Mm-hmm. So just because you're a plant-based eater does not mean that you eat an adequate amount of protein. You kind of have to like think a little bit about where you're going to get your protein from. Where are some of the foods they can get protein if they're plant-based? So people can get protein mainly from legumes. Truth is you can get protein from anywhere. You okay. can get protein from a banana. You can get protein from lettuce. You can get protein from tomatoes. It's everywhere, right? Yeah. It just tends to be more abundant in certain types of foods in the plant-based world. So the foods that are more abundant tend to be legumes, which are beans, peas, and lentils. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then in addition to that, whole grains tend to also be relatively protein rich as well. So those are things like quinoa and brown rice and yeah. uh, you know oatmeal and beyond. Yeah. So point being is that if you're consuming a diet that is like contains what we refer to as you know the the four sort of pillars of green light foods, including fruits plus starchy vegetables like potatoes and yams and root vegetables that you find in the ground, plus whole grains plus legumes and you're distributing your calories amongst those four types of food, then you're going to likely be eating plenty of protein on a daily basis. And it's not really a concern that, you know, your health is going to suffer as a result. Yeah. And this diet, like you went in this direction because you had uh, diabetes, right? And, and disease, but this diet is really good for all people that want to be healthy and well, and, and even overcome other chronic diseases, not just diabetes, right? You nailed it. You nailed it. Yeah. At first, when I went into this, uh, this like graduate degree, I wanted to try and figure out what was happening inside of me. Mm-hmm. And soon I got the answer to that. And then I started to recognize that eating a plant focused diet or a plant strong diet or a plant based diet, whatever you want to call it, is actually a very powerful diabetes reversal tool, not just a diabetes management tool. I don't care about managing diabetes. I care about reversing diabetes when it comes to prediabetes and type two. But in addition to that, eating a plant strong diet is a chronic disease reversing tool. And when I refer to chronic disease, I'm talking about the chronic diseases that affect the majority of the world today, not just Americans, but the whole world. Okay. Things like hypertension, Mm-hmm. It's, it, high blood pressure is literally affects more human beings today than ever before in human history. When you eat a plant-based diet, going all the way back to the 1950s, and Walter Kempner over at Duke University, he was the first person to describe that eating a plant-based diet is literally the most powerful anti-hypertension diet ever discovered for human beings. Mm-hmm. Okay, And then in addition to that, people who have high cholesterol, which is another form of cardiovascular disease, you eat a plant-based diet, your cholesterol plummets. Okay, people who are at risk for coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis, you eat a plant-based diet, boom, that risk goes out the window. Fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, prediabetes, type two diabetes, many forms of cancer, and even now Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease being literally cognitive decline, which happens over the course of 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Now, researchers are finding out over the past 10 to 15 years that when you eat a plant-strong diet, or a diet that contains actually the low saturated fat content, that that saturated, the low saturated fat content actually enables neurons to be alive for a longer period of time, which staves off the, the cognitive decline that affects so many people that staves off dementia and actually keeps you alive and mentally happy for a much longer period of time. Yeah, I'm already sold. I, I, this is the way that we've been eating for a long time, but I'm so glad you're explaining it 
in a way that will hopefully help a lot more people. What, I want to ask you a question, and we're getting close to the end of our time, but for sure. fruit, fruit got a bad name, you know, yeah. for a while, like stay away from fruit, too much sugar, especially around diabetes, right? You know, like oh, watch yeah. out fruit, but you talk about eating fruit. So talk to us about fruit a little bit. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up, actually, because fruit is just an absolutely completely misunderstood uh, food group, okay? So the narrative goes like this. Don't eat fruit because fruit contains sugar and sugar will make you fat or sugar will uh, cause your cholesterol to go up or sugar will make you diabetic, okay? So don't eat fruit because fruit may contain sugar and that's bad for you, right? But there's so many things wrong with that statement, I don't actually know where to start. <laughs> the first thing that I would say is that um, people use the word sugar completely incorrectly, okay? What I recommend doing is when we refer to the word sugar, when you use that word, the only thing that you should be thinking about, the only time you use that word is when you're referring to white table sugar, literally a white crystal. That's it, okay? Because that sugar is the sugar that we colloquially use and that's in our vernacular and that's what people are visualizing when they think of the word sugar, right? Even when they refer to a fruit, they literally think if I eat a banana, it'll turn into that white crystal and that white crystal is bad for me, okay? We know from plenty of evidence that when you consume that white crystal or any, uh, you know, any derivation of that white crystal, whether it's even if it's like high fructose corn syrup or any kind of artificial sweetener, that those artificial sweeteners are literally metabolic napalm. They are terrible for your vasculature. They're terrible for your brain. They're terrible for your sexual organs. They're terrible for your kidney. They're terrible for your pancreas. You name it. Just, just we, we got to get away from those foods, right? So that's the only time you should be using the word sugar. All other times, you should be using the word carbohydrate because carbohydrate is different. Carbohydrate is a much more complex structure from a chemical perspective. And that is technically speaking the biologically correct term to use when referring to food, okay? So if you, if you look at a, a fruit as an example, a fruit contain, is a complex three-dimensional matrix of many different macro and micronutrients together. You have carbohydrate, you have fat, you have protein. You also have vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. You have nine classes of micronutrients and macronutrients that are all wound up into one complex, very complex structure, okay? So... You, you, you eat a fruit, you have a pear, or you eat a mango, right? And most people think, oh, okay, well, the mango equals sugar. Again, the mango is just going to turn into a, a pile of white sugar, and that's going to be bad for me. But the truth is that that mango has some carbohydrate energy in it for sure, and that's part of what gives it a sweet flavor. But in addition to that, there's a little bit of fat, there's a little bit of protein, and there's all those other micronutrients I talked about. So what happens to that three-dimensional matrix is that once it goes inside of your digestive system, it takes time to unravel that matrix. It takes time to start to partially digest the fiber rebar and get access to the micronutrients and get access to the carbohydrate and the fat and the protein and then start to degrade that stuff and pull it out of your digestive system and put it into your blood. And then once it's in your blood, it has to get transported. So there's a, there's a whole symphony of things that are happening. And the, the point that I want to drive home here is that when you consume a fruit, because it's a complex structure, the fruit takes time to digest and absorb. And time is your friend when it comes to food. Things that take more time to digest enable glucose, not sugar, but glucose and amino acids and fatty acids to get into your blood at a reasonable rate, at a reasonable speed. When they get inside of your blood at a reasonable speed, then biochemistry unfolds exactly the way it's supposed to. But when you consume that white crystal that we talked about, the white crystal has no protection. There's no fiber, there's no vitamins, no minerals, no antioxidants, no uh, phytochemicals, there's no fat, and there's no protein. So as a result of that, it's literally missing eight of nine nutrients. And as a result of that, when you consume that white table sugar, well, guess what happens? It travels into your digestive system and it gets inside of your blood very quickly. We're talking within five minutes. And as a result of that, it gets in quickly and it's unprotected and a lot of it will get in at the same time. That is what starts the process of many chronic diseases. 
Yeah. That's the type of physiological process that can get your liver upset and your pancreas to oversecrete insulin and your muscles to get pissed off and your heart to get pissed off and your eyes to start going, getting degraded and your brain to start suffering, right? So if we're gonna talk about sugar, we only talk about refined sugar. And if we're gonna be talking about things like fruits, even potatoes, even whole grains, even legumes, we have to use the word carbohydrate and more specifically, whole carbohydrate energy that comes protected with all those other macro and micronutrients, macro and micronutrients. And when you think of food as being a complex three-dimensional structure, it makes a lot of sense and the whole, your whole understanding of biology becomes just that much more accurate. That, that description was worth the, uh, the price of admission. That was amazing. That was so cool the way that you oh, talked fun. about fruit. Yeah, that was so good. You know, we could talk for hours and hours, but our time is coming up. I, I do want to thank you. You've been so amazing. We're, and I know you've blown so many people's minds. Where can they find you in your work? Where, where can they go to get more of you? Yeah, thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Uh, the, okay, there's, there's two sort of main places that I would go. Uh, the first one on your computer or your phone, you can just go to masteringdiabetes.org. Okay, that's our website. And we basically run a coaching program for people living with all forms of diabetes to help them reverse the underlying cause, which is called insulin resistance. And when you do that, then you can reverse prediabetes in type 2 and get phenomenal control of type 1. And before you give the second one, you know, people watching this, you may or may not have diabetes, but I bet you know someone who does. And send them to that site. If it's not you, if it is you, go there, obviously. But if it's not you, send your friends, family, loved ones to, to that site. Because, you know, rather than just having them medicated, Cyrus has real answers to help them with this situation. 100%, 100%. And we are not anti-pharmaceutical medication. We recommend that people use pharmaceutical medication when necessary. We just use a food first approach. And the whole process here is to basically allow your, to educate people about how your food is actually your most powerful medicine. And once you learn that, and once you apply the principles of the Mastering Diabetes Method, you are likely to find that you can get off of many pharmaceutical medications, not only for diabetes, but also for heart disease and also for weight loss and beyond, and get to a more physiologically normal uh, state of being where you feel great, you look great, and you're basically free of chronic disease. Yeah. And then the and second then, site, the second place? The, the second place I would send people to is uh, go to Amazon and pick up the Mastering Diabetes book, okay? And again, I'm gonna say this, even though it has the word diabetes in the title, the truth is that the book is actually not necessarily about mastering diabetes. It is, it's about mastering your health. It's about mastering chronic disease, okay? So just go you know, type in Mastering Diabetes and pick up that book and, and read it um, and hopefully you'll learn a lot about what we were talking about here today, but it goes a lot into depth about like, what is the actual reason why so many people in this world are living with many forms of chronic disease and how every chronic disease effectively can be traced to one central condition. And that one central condition is called insulin resistance. And when you really conceptually understand what insulin resistance is, how it's formed, and what consequences it has on your body, and you eat in a way that reverses insulin resistance, it's literally a gateway to reversing most of the chronic diseases that affect most people in today's world. Amazing, Cyrus. This amazing job today. Thank you so much for being with us and helping so many people. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate it. This is such an awesome summit. And I, along with my co-hosts, Master Chun-Yi Lin and Jason Prawl, would like to take a moment to thank all the staff members, those people behind the scenes, plus our gifted speakers you've been learning from. And most of all, we want to thank our Summit sponsors. Please be sure to check them out with the links that are given in the videos. And make sure you do it because they help make this incredible event possible for you. So if you can, support our sponsors. I am honored to have the co-host of the Global Energy Healing Summit on with me right now. And his name is Chun Yi Lin. He's somebody that I can't remember how long ago I met Chun Yi, but the minute I met him, he just left an impression. And it was not something where, you know, he was trying to be impressive and 
and uh, you know, kind of make a big deal about who he was. It was that it was it, exactly the opposite. His heart was so big and so loving and so warm that I just knew this is a person I had to meet and I had to get to know. And he and I are part of a group called the Transformational Leadership Council. He was in it before I was. And I came in probably a few years after he was in it, but still probably 12 years ago. And he's become he's become one of my dearest friends, one of my go to people when I've got a problem or an issue. He is one of the most enlightened people, I believe, on the planet. He's a Qigong master, was named the top Qigong master in all of America. I can't remember what year it was, but uh, several years ago, and he's written books about healing. His goal in life is to have a healer in every home, which is really beautiful. And so through his Qigong and through his healing teachings, that's what he's set out to do. I know he's got a new book coming out uh, soon. We we're just talking about that. He's super busy now, so he's trying to finish writing it, but, but that'll be out. So Chun Yi, I'm so excited to have you here. Welcome, good to see you. Yeah, Tom, is, I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy and so, so, so much honor and joy to have you in my life. And, you know, so I, I think, you know, we met each other uh, 13 or 14 years ago. That yeah. was a long time ago. When I remember we, we, we sit down and we had a little conversation and right after that, you know, so we became yeah. very, very good friend. We, from the heart, we connected. Of course, you were, you were my teacher too. You helped me to open my heart to the world in so many different ways. And I greatly appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. No, I've gotten so much more from you than I think I've ever given you. And it's funny because even when I'm looking at, and, and maybe this is just me, but looking at your picture, like behind you, there's this golden glow, like this golden aura. And I don't know if it's lighting or, it's, or if I'm seeing your aura, but I really see you that way. So, hey, today, what we're going to talk about, something that I learned from you in uh, the, the Spring Forest Qigong practice is at the very beginning of the practice, we always, uh, one of the things we do is we call on the energy of the masters. And mm -hmm. when I first heard that, you know, 13, 14 yeah. years ago, I'm like, okay, well, how can I call on the energy of someone that's not right here? And, yeah. you know, call on your energy and you invite people to call on your energy. You invite people to call on the energy of your masters or, or their masters or any anybody, their relatives, people that they admire and like their energy. Talk a little bit about that. That's a little bit of a foreign concept to people right now. Where they think, you know, I just have my energy. What do you mean I can call on the energy of someone that's not even physically in the room with me? How the heck does that work? Wow, so absolutely. Um, think, think it in this way. Um, energy is energy. Energy, the, uh, there's um, so many different forms. In a spiritual practice, there's a form of energy which is very powerful, helping us to connect in the soul level, in the spiritual level. That is the information of your masters, the information of the universe that has like a higher vibration. So this becomes the signature of Spring Forest Qigong practice. People came to Spring Forest Qigong and experienced Qigong with some other forms. They immediately found there's something very unique in Spring Forest Qigong. Just one of the unique things we, we do at the very beginning is call upon the master's energy to support. Energy healing, from healing perspective, energy healing is a signal healing. Is a message healing, is information healing. When you call upon this information, the higher vibration of your masters, several things happen. Number one, you tap into the master's chi field. So that chi field, the vibration is many, the, the, I mean, the, the energy travel, traveling speed is many, many times faster than the speed of light. Mm. This has been studied, you know, so uh, scientists already did study. And one, one scientist, I, uh, I read his book, is, uh, he's a, in the former president of Taiwan University. Mm. And uh, he, 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 he is one of the leading scientist in physics. 
So he said, it's even one, I mean, 0 0.1 billion times faster than the light speed in the Qi field. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So that's yeah. why when you, when you call the point the master's energy, you download this information of the masters. Now, that, now the masters which have, you know, who have been practicing what they do what, for a long, long time, and it becomes a collective consciousness. This con collective consciousness becomes condensed information, condensed wow. energy. And when, when, by, when I say condensed, that means that the, the quality of the energy is just so powerful and the vibration is so many times higher than the regular energy centers you can imagine. Like when you call the point Buddha's energy, you call the point Jesus energy, you call, call the point God's energy, uh, uh, um, Muhammad's energy, you know, yeah. Kuan Yin's energy, or your uh, spiritual teacher's energy, and you, even your grandpa, grandma's energy, they will be right there for you, and as information to support you. Wow. And especially when you call the point is a higher level of masters and teachers, they have so much wisdom and you tap into their wisdom well, yeah. you tap into their wisdom center and you are able to access the wisdom to guide you for specific needs you are really needing now. Wow. for helping you to balance your energy, to heal your body, or to solve a, a situation, and, or find an answer to your difficulties, and, and whatever your purpose is, you tell that to the universe, to the masters, and then you tap into the master's energy field, which is you call upon the master's energy, and then this information will flow into your head, will flow into your brain, helping you and guiding you to the right direction to find the source to help you with the challenges. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like you talk, a lot of the people that you mentioned, spiritual leaders, they're, they're not physically here, but their energy is still yeah. available to be called on. Like that's Absolutely. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, as information, it exists in the universe in right. any place. It is just like a universal library. You tap into it. I like that term, universal yeah. library. That, but that that that's going to challenge some people's thinking. That can that you know think, hey, wait a minute, it's not here. I can't touch it. I can't feel it. Yeah. So you have to have faith, right? And you have to yeah. invoke. You have to call on this. Yeah. I'm a huge believer in it, and I know you're not just believing it because it's something you've been told you can actually see energy you can feel energy that's mm -hmm. something you've trained yourself to do as a qigong master so you really experience this and it's yeah. it's it's where a lot of your wisdom comes from is tapping into your masters that yeah. are no longer here in the physical realm but you still yeah. can bring their energy to to propel you to new things which is really cool yes absolutely and this is what i do for instance and uh, I, I, I was taught you know, this by my masters too. So when I do healing, if I found that this person has a, for instance, like a religious background, mm -hmm. uh, like a, a Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. So then I will call upon Jesus energy to come in to support my healing, to oh, help wow. this person. Yeah. So as soon as I call upon Jesus energy to come to show up, now, like at this moment, I talk about Jesus. Immediately, I saw the face of Jesus, the eyes mm -hmm. just blinking, shining the light on me. I, you know, so I just feel so honored to, to be able yeah. to do that. Yeah, but yeah. everybody can do that. Yeah. And uh, it, for me, my thought I open, I can see these images in front of me. Right. But if, if your thought I not not open, like what I do, you can still feel the vibration yeah. of your masters when you call upon like a, a Buddha's energy, you know, Kuan Yin's energy, all right? 
or right? and any other master's energy in your in your practice, like a Moses yeah. energy, and they will be right there supporting you because this in energy, a higher vibration as information stored in the universe all the time. It's a like, uh, timeless. Yeah. And it's, it, uh, it's no limitation of time, no limitation of space, and no limitation of speed. It's the people uh, uh, in nowadays are uh, very, very uh, uh, hard talking about quantum physics. It's exactly like that. And, uh, it's, and this power, this chi, to me, it's even, uh, even more powerful than quantum physics can, yeah. can demonstrate. And one of the principles of quantum physics that I love is that everything is everywhere all the time. So you can yeah. call on this energy. And there's, it's not like, okay, if you call on Jesus's energy, then there's not enough left for me. <laughs> there's plenty, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, even your energy, exactly. you invite people to call on your energy and, yeah. and you're not worried about, okay, well, if they call on my energy, then I won't have enough because you just, you have ever expanding energy yeah. as, yeah. as people uh, call on it, right? Yeah. It is information. It is yeah. a message. It is a, uh, it is a good signal. It's just like, you know, you have, uh, you send a message uh, through your uh, computer and you type the message, you know, how many people you can send to the world, you know, yeah, so yeah. millions of people, right? Yeah. Everyone in yeah. the, on the planet can get the message, but you only send one. And that's the information, that's the source. And uh, you use this higher vibration, the information, to help you to ignite the energy within yeah. you and yeah. working together with the, the energy within you, then you can drive the energy to that direction to serve your purpose much faster and more efficiently and more e effectively. Yeah, you know, you just spurred an insight for me because when you, uh, you, when you equated it to technology, I thought, you know, I just thought of, hey, there's, information let's say in, in an article on the internet anybody can search that through google or whatever you use a chrome whatever you're using and and now all of a sudden everybody can have that information that's the same way that energy works exactly exactly yeah. and that's, you're so right tom <laughs> yeah so that so so this is such a powerful concept you have been doing this, I think, for a long time, right? Ever since you wow. <laughs> learned it. And yeah. it's one of the reasons you have so much mm -hmm. power in your energy. Chun Yi, just so everybody knows, like if I have like a little ache or pain, I call Chun Yi up and not every time, but you know, sometimes if I'm a little concerned, I go, hey, Chun Yi, I got this going on. And he goes, okay, hold on. He goes, yeah, you got a blockage here. You got a blockage there. And he's in Minneapolis. I'm in San Diego, but he, 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 truly is not stuck just in the physical world. I think too many of us have both our feet firmly planted just in the physical limitations we see around us, limitations of space and time. Chen Yi functions in the physical world, but he also functions in the non-physical where him being in Minneapolis, me being in San Diego makes no difference in his ability to, to send energy, to see, blockages i mean it's just so amazing what you've been able to do because you've you've developed that but you're mm -hmm. trying to tell everybody you can develop it too it's not just me absolutely you just need to open your heart yeah to come out with with your comfortable zone yeah and then you can try something bigger than your fears is yeah um, when you break the 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 fans uh, of uh, of your fears, and then you can see a much bigger lawn, you know, so yeah. in your, and in the world. So this is what I what, what it is. Yeah. And then you trust and uh, um, trust your heart, trust your spirit, and trust your soul, and trust the masters. And trust. That's a big word, yeah. though. Yeah. Even tr trust what's happening. Like if you go, well, you know, I, I, it, it, I feel something a little bit different, but it's probably not that. Like if you don't have that trust, 
because part of it is it, it'll feel like it's just your imagination when you feel a little different when you call in the energy it's it, and it's not just your imagination it really is but you've got to trust that that it's working trust that it's coming trust right. that you can yeah. call on this energy yeah once you trust you tap into the energy field of your masters you tap into the wisdom center of your masters and then you are be able in the head level make the connection between you and your masters be between you and the divine then that information can flow through the invisible court yeah. <laughs> from the center from your master's heart into your head yeah and this is one of the keys everybody watching and listening this is one of the keys to mastering the physical world is mastering the the non-physical with the trust and calling on energy chun yi's done and he, he he's the most humble guy probably that i've ever met and and also one of the most powerful but he doesn't he never brags about it but it's interesting things that that he's done over the years where uh through trusting and through learning like uh, i know in one of your things you had to do to become a qigong master was how long were you in a cave? How, how many days was that? Oh, I, many times I've been in a cave and uh, sometimes uh, three days and you know, eight days and you know, the longest, uh, 28 days. 28 days with, yeah. with like only like two things of water and an apple or something like that. What was it? Yeah, like uh, and the last time is uh, like uh, um, five bottles of water, you know, the, those are small bottles. Yeah. And, and then so got five apples and yeah. five apples. Yeah. yeah. For 28 days. So <laughs> yeah. think about, think about what really happened. I mean, he is so in tune with energy and the masters that he controlled his physical body where yeah. you think, you know, most people like I drink five, five little bottles of water every day. You yeah. did that over 28 days and you came yeah. out fine and, and five apples. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> truly amazing. And, and this is, by the way, this is, this is, things that Chen Yi would say, you you have the potential all to do. Now you've got to work, I mean, he's worked at it and and call on the energies. But uh, one of the things I love about Chen Yi is he's not trying to put himself up above everyone else. Like he wants everyone to learn through him that this is possible for, for anybody because also Chen Yi, I, I know your story about as a child, you know, and, and the pain you grew up with and the physical ailments and those things don't exist anymore. You've transformed and healed yourself, which is really amazing. Yeah, so I had arthritis in my knees and the swelling in my knees. And I grew yeah. up in the southern part of China, the humidity, oh, yeah. I tell you, it's it just <laughs> so unbearable. Yeah. Um, I mean, the pain and, and at night and many times and just couldn't, couldn't uh, lay down at all. Yeah. Also, I have a bone spot in my lower back, in my neck, and and then I had suicidal depression, many things. But because of Qigong, and I became who I am. I'm happy every day. I enjoy my life every day. You know. Yeah. So, and you know, life that's is the great. thing I love. You are one of the happiest people. <laughs> one of the happiest people I know, which is really really wonderful. Uh, and and one of the most giving people. Like really truly helping. Take us, uh, what, I know every morning what you wake up at a certain time and you do like a, like a, a fairly long meditation, right? Yeah, so um, every, uh, uh, every day at uh, 4.30 and uh, later it's 5 o'clock and I got up. And before I even got up like at 3.30 you know, to meditate and do, do my Qigong practice until 7.30, 8 o'clock. Wow. And, so, and, that, and then you know, at noon, I would take uh, at least half an hour to do you know, meditation and mm. then evening and up to my work in uh, doing healing or teaching. Then I will do another one hour or two meditation before I go to bed. Well, Qigong is me and uh, Qigong is my life. And I'm yeah. Qigong and Qigong is me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And yeah, you're an amazing teacher. Uh, you've got lots of great courses through Spring Forest Qigong, and Qigong is Q-I-G-O-N-G.com. Uh, Chen Yi has courses on how to practice Qigong. He has courses on how to heal with Qigong. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, so please check that out. And lots of like one of the things I really love that, that Chun Yi and his wonderful wife Deborah do is they have really great content that's free that you can get with how to heal pains and different spots and things you can do, uh, you know, to press on or to to rub or, you know, a headache, right? How to get a <laughs> headache, neck ache, lots of great stuff. So make sure everybody you go to Spring Force Qigong and, and sign up for what they do, even if it's just for their free content, mm -hmm. it's really, really powerful. And the other thing that I'm super excited about is uh, Chen Yi and I now have a, a new thing that we're doing. It's called Life Force Blessings. Dot com life force blessings dot com and last year in January Chun Yi did this program with uh, Tibetan monks who he, which he's been doing for years but I never knew about it so I didn't know about yeah. it but I <laughs> I saw it last year and one of the things that I was really wanting to do I've been wanting to do this for several years is to be able to connect help the Western world connect with uh, these beautiful monks, these Tibetan monks that really, they really devote their life to uplifting the energy on the planet mm -hmm. and, and, and ridding us all from suffering. And so uh, Chen Yi had these monks and he would lead a session with a meditation and the monks would be chanting. And when they chant, when they meditate and chant, they're giving off energy and they do this every day. So exactly. they're incredible exactly. energy masters, yep. just like Chen Yi is. And so I said, oh, my gosh, I signed up and, you know, uh, one of the things you could do is have your family blessed. And I signed up everyone in my family. And I said, Chen Yi, we got to we got to spread this to more of the world. And so we, we we created Life Force Blessings. And one of the things that we're able to do now is every morning during Chen Yi's multi hour meditation, uh, he will be able to send like you can call in his energy. You can do that anytime. If you want targeted healing energy or energy for whatever purpose, uh, we're able to tap into that now. And then also with mm -hmm. the monks. So I'm really excited about that. And you can learn more about that at lifeforceblessings.com. And I'm super excited to be, be doing that with you. Originally, it was just going to be the monks, but Chandi said, no, no, no. I want in my meditation, I want to be able to send people this energy too. And I'm just so yeah. grateful that you're willing to yeah. do that. Yeah. May I, say some, may I say something about that too? Tom? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I highly recommend people to do that, to take advantage of this. Um, so blessing, so enlightening yeah. uh, opportunities to help yourself and help your family. Yeah. And because the monks have been chanting the, those chants for their life. And yeah. these chants have been lasting in the history for thousands of years. It becomes a collective consciousness. It has the power when you chant to help to clear karmas, to clear the negative vibration around you, to, and also even help you with the protection and any other unknown energy or uh, unnecessary energy, unwanted energy, which am I coming on your way uh, for instance, you know, so many chaotic, chaotic things happening in the world right now. So if you have this energy to bless you, to empower you to become some protection, that will, that will be in time to help you to clear all the unnecessary forms of energy coming to you, causing illnesses and sickness and or life challenges yeah. and accidents and these kind of things. And then the other thing is, if you do have something already going on in your life, you need more energy. Right. So, and the blessing from the monks, the, the energy sending you know, from my heart to you can help to clear the energy channels and blockages uh, together with your energy, you know, with your heart with the unconditional, the unconditional love in your heart and uh, the unconditional love from our heart to, can resonate together to yeah. help to open up channels and uh, clear wrong information and block unnecessary information outside of you. 
So it is, it is just like a, a great, great gift. And uh, I'm just so, so happy to do this. I'm just so honored that I, I am, I'm able, um, I have this opportunity to work with the Tibetan monks and uh, to help people. And yeah, no, me too. And I, I can't mm -hmm. wait to spread this to the world. It, it's something I think that people need. I mean, I, selfishly, I first thought of the concept just for me and my family, because I'm like, I want that energy. I want my children, my wife, uh, my relatives to have that little extra protection, that energy yeah. that can help them be healthier, happier, yeah. more prosperous, prosperity. Oh, uh, yes. Because I'd heard of, I, I, I was on an airplane and this guy told me that he had found some monks that he made contributions and and they would send mm -hmm. energy and chant for his business mm -hmm. and the guy became a billionaire right so i'm like whoa that was impressive I, i've always believed in energy and then talking with you i said you know mm -hmm. let's do this and and then you said uh, i'll do it but i don't want it just be the monks i want to be able to help people too so yeah. so it's like the extra added benefit which i'm like i, I wouldn't want chan yi to have to spend yeah. his time doing this too yeah. but that was so amazing of you. And uh, part of the proceeds actually go to the monks. So yeah. uh, they they can continue to do their good works mm -hmm. and in relieving mm -hmm. the world of suffering, everybody, by mm -hmm. what we are able to do with Life Force Blessings. So oh, yeah. you know, I'm honored, I'm thrilled. We're just getting started with it, but we'd love for anybody that's interested to come on this journey yeah. with us do good things for you and your family, but also raise the level of consciousness for the entire planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a good difference. It makes a big difference. Yeah. And no matter if it's for, for your own health, for your own fate, for your own prosperity, or for your business, or for your connection with the outside world, or for your spiritual development. Now, people are looking for like an open a third eye, develop the spirituality. And I mean, so this energy, it's just so, I mean, incredible. And yeah. I, I know words can reveal that beauty and unless you experience it. Yeah, and the power. And so we talked about calling on energy, every, you know, uh, depending upon how uh, you, you, you work with this, right because there's an option yeah. to have the energy sent once a month once mm -hmm. a week every day yeah. but not only can you call on the energy it'll be directed to you yeah. or to exactly. your family members yeah. individually where where now it's it's actually coming to you whether you're calling it or not mm -hmm. now still keep calling on it because that's a good practice yeah but and you can even direct it like what to do yeah. with it so powerful yeah. we teach you more how to do that with life force blessings but yeah. again i'm excited and and i i just love being able to work with my dear friend chun yi and uplifting the world and making it a better place for everybody yeah absolutely i'm 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 just so, so thrilled and overjoyed having this opportunity to solve the world. Yeah. So please check out lifeforceblessings.com. Chun Yi, thank you so much uh, for being such a great friend and, and for being such a loving person, not just to me, but to everybody. I, the love this man has in his heart, I guarantee you, everyone watching this, he, he might not see you right now uh, while you're watching it, but his energy is coming to you just by watching this. This video even has an energy that you will benefit from watching. So make sure all your friends watch this. And uh, Chen Yi, any final words you have for everybody? Well, the most powerful healing energy or uh, the energy connects you to the world is unconditional love. Always focus, focus on your unconditional love with unconditional love and activate your compassion. With the compassion, you connect to the world and open your heart. Trust yourself, trust your masters, and trust the divine. And when you, have, when you purify your energy in that way, you can connect to the source and you can be protected anytime. So. Yeah. Hey, I, lots of love to you. Thank you so much. And thank you. I'm really happy that people are getting to meet you through this video. And, and we hope that uh, they'll come along on this journey with us together. So thanks so much, Chen Yi. No, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Do you feel like you might miss any of these incredible interviews? 
There's a lot of great information being shared, so I'd understand if you did, but don't worry. You can pick up your VIP All Access Pass at a special discount right now. So you can have lifetime on-demand access to the entire summit and all of its bonuses. So go ahead and grab your VIP access now by clicking on the button below so you can watch, listen, and even read the transcripts at your own leisure. I'm excited to introduce everybody to our next guest, although many of you may have already seen him because he's written seven New York Times best-selling books. Also, he's had five PBS specials that were so successful, they raised $70 million or over $70 million for PBS. His name is Dr. Joel Furman. He's a board certified family physician, but what he's really specialized in is, uh, I think you call it nutritional excellence. Is that right, Joel? I love that term, nutritional excellence and how when we eat the right things, and you're gonna learn about what the right things are today, we can not only prevent disease, but we can overcome chronic diseases, things that our physicians are treating us with, many of our physicians are treating with medication, we can use nutritional excellence to treat many of these diseases. So, Joel, welcome. I'm so excited to have you for all our guests that are watching, and I'm excited to learn too from you. So thanks for being here. My pleasure, Tom. Looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. And one thing too that I just have to mention, uh, I got to know Joel earlier in the year and he's actually become a friend. But one thing I did not know was that he lived 10, 10 minutes away from me. So we've gotten together now and played some pickleball. And, uh, and I can tell you uh, one thing actually that uh, you didn't have in your bio that you gave me, Joel, but Joel was an athlete growing up, and, and even to this day, he's got some excellence in his athleticism because uh, he's really good out there on the pickleball court, too. So, uh, Joel, let's kind of dive in. Nutritional excellence, can you talk about what that means? And, and uh, you know, that's the first time I've, I've heard, like, eating well and things like that, but nutritional excellence, like being excellent with your nutrition, what, what does that concept mean to you, and what, what does it mean to all our people watching? You know, it means that how important is it for everybody to really understand the ideal way to eat, the pinnacle of nutritional excellence? Because many people would like to push the envelope of human longevity and live to be 100 years old or, you know, 95 to 105 and, and in great health with their full physical and mental capacity intact. And one of the points I'm teaching and explaining here is when you achieve this degree of nutritional excellence, and I call this dietary style, the portfolio of foods that have the most nutrient density and micronutrient diversity that encompasses all the nutrients humans need. And when you achieve this degree, it becomes therapeutically effective to reverse disease. So now the person loses weight effortlessly. They lose their craving to overeat. They feel satisfied with the right amount of calories their blood pressure comes back to normal, their chest pains and their atherosclerosis starts to diminish and melt away, preventing them from ever having a future heart attack or stroke, their headaches go away, and even autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, um, fibromyalgia, these things disappear with time and we can slowly wean people off their medications. So what I'm saying right now is, that nutritional excellence is therapeutically much more effective than drug med than, than pharmacologic treatment of disease. Because when you're on a pharmacologic treatment for psoriatic arthritis, you're on drugs the rest of your life. And it's well accepted that these drugs you're taking cause cancer. So you're making a pact with the devil. I'm going to have my psoriasis and my joint pain get a little better, but I'm going to get cancer and die 20 years longer just to get my skin looking better. That's, you know, it's really sad. Yeah. And, and most people don't know, aren't aware that, um, that diabetic medications accelerate the progression of diabetes. You take more insulin, you're gaining weight faster, you're becoming more diabetic. You take um, gliburide, glip, you know, glucotrol, all these drugs for diabetes that make you gain weight and make the beta set, the failing beta cells in the pancreas work harder to lower your blood glucose, th thus failing at a faster rate accelerating both the morbidity and mortality from diabetes. 
So what I'm saying is that the fact that we've, that medical care has, um, you know, grown into pharmacological based treatments has led to the sickest and most, you know, and the poorest life expectancy scores that are diminishing. So people are living to around 80, but their life is not even worth living. They're, yeah. they're just in poor, have such poor health. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, Tom, right now that half of our population, 50% are either diabetic or pre-diabetic at this point, 50%. Crazy. And we're not seeing enhancement in lifespan due to modern medical science. We're seeing diminishing in lifespan potential from modern medical science. We're not living. So there's so much confusion and mass, um, mass um, dispersion of, of misinformation that people think access to medical care and taking more drugs is the way to get better health. And I'm saying, you know, with, within a few weeks of eating right, your risk of heart disease can diminish of having a heart attack diminishes by more than a thousand fold. And with time, your risk of heart disease of having a heart attack related death can, can disappear and become, and that's the leading, the leading cause of death of people over the age of 60, of course, is heart attacks and strokes. Yeah. And that's an all, almost all needless deaths. Yeah, Joel, I'm a true, true believer in what you're saying. So I, I'm just curious why are you kind of the not maybe not the only lone wolf, but there's not enough doctors like you that are taking this message out to the world. Thank God you are with your PBS specials and your books, but it makes such sense what you're talking about. Why is the world still suffering from all these diseases? What the heck's going on? You know, that's a rough question to answer. You have to keep there are billions of dollars being spent to keep people addicted to food the processed industry, the food industry, the pharmacologic industry, the drug industry, billions of dollars trying to brainwash people and get them hooked and addicted to highly processed, calorically concentrated, highly palatable foods and fast foods destroy people's brains. It, it hooks them like, a, like they're, they're drug addicts and yeah. they can't even make rationally think straight. But you know, but we have a, a lot of great lifestyle medicine physicians in this country and we have the growth of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, a new board certified specialty that where doctors are treating people with diet, nutrition, and exercise. And we have thousands of physicians now who have become board certified by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Awesome. So true, it's just a small fraction of doctors, but there is a movement in this direction and more general acceptance among both the medical community and the scientific community of the power of nutritional excellence. In other words, the International Journal of Disease Prevention and Disease Reversal and Prevention has been, I've published maybe four, four medical journal articles in these medical journals that specialize in, in demonstrating that diseases can be reversed through nutrition. And it's no longer seen as something like far out, radical, alternative. This is mainstream now. Yeah. You know, and, and now we have to get the public aware of it because it has to be, and it has to start with the school system. It should be reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutritional science to a great that. school yeah. and high school and colleges. I'm working on a college and, and graduate school textbook right now, but there's so much, an overwhelming amount of science that supports these viewpoints that what I'm saying right now is this information is not radical, it's proven, it's demonstrated in scientific studies not just with my work, but for the work of other leaders in this field of nutritional medicine that have published studies showing the reversal of heart disease. I published a study with over 450 people showing their systolic blood pressure dropped 26 points within six months while we were taking their medications away. Wow. You know, so I published studies on reversal of diabetes, reversal of heart disease, low normal blood pressure. I've had studies on reversal, published myself studies on reversal of uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, you know, and, and other, um, other autoimmune diseases. And I highlighted um, I, my most recent book, of course, Eat for Life, has more than 2,000 medical references. And I'm mentioning that because I want people to know that this is not just the you know, one person's opinion. It's well documented and well supported by a, um, an overwhelming amount of, of evidence, which is documented in that book. And people can, so it's written so, so lay people can understand it. They yeah. can see what happens to the transformational results that happen to people. But, but a doctor, a scientist, a, neutral, a researcher can get all the data, all the research, all the supportive information to see that 
we have to change the trajectory of healthcare from being drug oriented to being food oriented. That's, I love it. You know, so yeah. We've got to change. If we don't, we're just suffering. And, and all the COVID deaths are also needless deaths. And that sounds radical, too, because people are so misinformed. But healthy people with great nutrition aren't susceptible to dying from COVID. It's just demonstrative that we're, of how bad we're taking care of our health, that our immune systems are so weak that, we, that we're actually killed by a, by a virus. Yeah, I, I believe in that, too. And that's such a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because there's so much fear right now. Yeah. Even even more fear potentially than well in the beginning there was a lot of fear but now the new variant and there may be another variant that comes out and people are really afraid but if you have a healthy strong immune system like you said you you know you may get some symptoms but you're going to be fine your immune system will be able to fight that off so I love that you're saying that you know um, and also just some of the analogies you're giving like. <clears throat> um, things melting away, you know, clogged arteries where, you know, the, the clog is melting away. I mean, that's such a beautiful visual metaphor because so many people think, oh, my arteries clogged. I need to get to go get surgery or get on um, cholesterol lowering drug, which those probably aren't that great for you either. Right. And and, uh, you know, I love I love the visual representation you're giving people. How the heck did you get started with this? I think you told me you became a doctor because this was already your passion, but how, how did nutritional excellence and, and using nutrition to prevent and treat disease, how did that even come to be such a passion for you, Joel? You know, I was doing all the reading when I was a teenager. My a father teenager. was over, yeah, it's, <laughs> my, my father was overweight and had some medical issues that were you know, serious. So he started reading books on nutrition to try to lose weight and get healthier himself. So I'd read all the books with him. I was on the United States World Figure Skating Team. I was a pair skater with my sit, my younger sister. Yeah. And we were eating healthy to improve our stamina and our, you know, and maintain our, you know, not getting sick. Because when you, it's like any sport. If you're out with a flu or with colds, you can't train and you can't peak at the right time. You know, you yeah. have to stay well all the time. And I, you know, but in any case. So I started reading the books to benefit myself. I saw my father's benefits and I started reading a lot of literature, um, you know, back in the 1960s and 19, <laughs> early 1970s. Yeah. And by the time I um, kind of like my skating career in the late 70s kind of was petering out, um, you know, I was um, trans, um, transitioning into my family business. My father owned 12 shoe stores in the New York metropolitan area. And as I was, you know, going to take over the, the family business, I realized I was so much more passionate and enthusiastic about changing people's health and the, my, and the realization that you don't have to be sick, that people don't have to get cancer. They don't have to have heart disease. They don't have to suffer with, with all these diseases and take drugs the rest of their life. And why wouldn't everybody want to do this? Why wouldn't everybody want to not get be sick and live a life without disease and without fear? Yeah. And I thought this is such a powerful message. And the right way to deliver that message is to go to medical school and get a traditional medical education to have, be the most effective in, in explaining and transforming people's lives. And also the fact that you have to wean people off medications. You have to prescribe to because you don't just stop medications, it has to be slowly tapered down in most cases. So you have to be able to prescribe to be able to help people. And I realized that, wow, this would be tremendously rewarding if I, even if, even if everybody didn't want to change the way they ate. I always knew there'd be a, a niche, a segment of society that would want nutrition as the answer to their issues, their problems. And when I have a great career like this, and I've, I've been very, very blessed and grateful for the opportunities I've had to, to affect positively affect so many people and even work with so many people one-on-one -on -one and, and see this incredible transformation that occur in their health. It's so satisfying to them and to me and to, it just gives you a tremendous amount of personal satisfaction. So I yeah. think I'm very, um, you know, I made the right decision certainly in going back to yeah. medical school. It's been a very exciting and pleasurable experience to work with so many people like that. Yeah, well, you've helped millions, and and you've hacked, you've changed, you've changed the world, right? You've helped spread the message. Where now, you know, you didn't used to see vegan restaurants or you know healthy options at even at you know more traditional restaurants, but now they're starting to add it in because a lot more people are jumping on this 
hopefully it's a bandwagon, right? That continues to go on. You mentioned the food industry, and I, I do want to talk about that a little bit because uh, people, most people, like you wrote, your first book was Eat to Live. Uh, your latest book, which everyone makes sure you get, is is Eat for Life. And what most people do is they eat for taste. And 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 by the way, you have recipes and things that taste really, really good, but people are going for the the fatty fried foods, the sugary foods. And you mentioned it's almost like a drug. I believe it is a drug. I believe, you know, refined sugar is a drug. It's addictive. You mentioned that too. Uh how do you get people to overcome? Like they they hear you, they go, yeah, it makes a lot of sense what Joel's saying. I don't want to be sick. But then they they go and they see something really sugary and they they gobble it up or they watch, you know, these ridiculous commercials for uh, some of the worst, I think. Uh, well, I won't even say the name, but there's like a hamburger joint where they're just like the grossest uh ingredients and they show them but for some people it's like oh my god i gotta have that right and people go there and uh how do how do you create the change in behavior how how do you accomplish that i know you have a center here near where you and i live where you're doing that for a lot of people but how does somebody that reads your book what are some ways they can start to change and not go back like i made the change i would never go back to the way i ate when i was younger Right. I just like, oh, that's disgusting. But how can people do that? That's exactly what you're saying is true, that the that we feel that like we wouldn't even want to eat those foods. We see them no. drugs. It's like yeah. you couldn't get 10 men to tie me down and to shoot me up with <laughs> Coke. It's like want to eat a pizza or a burger or some soda or some pretzels or some cookies. It's like that yeah. is bro. That's drug. Those are drugs. Yeah. And the definition of a drug, it affects the brain. You're ruining, you're destroying brain cells with the flux of, of the high caloric concentration from fried foods and sugars getting into the brain. You're losing brain cells, but you're stimulating dopamine centers in the brain that become dopamine insensitive from the overstimulation in the same areas of the brain where opiates and narcotics stimulate you. So then you're craving more calories, you're craving more sugar, and you can't get those things out of your mind as being attracted to them. So it leads to a mass addictive population population that supports each other with socialization and the normalization of addictive foods. So that they're on every street corner and it becomes okay to come off alcohol. And you realize when you're coming off alcohol, you need to stay away from bars and not drink because a little bit of drinking pushes you into further drinking. And it's, you know, it's, it's better to, it's easier to quit alcohol and to quit cocaine if you have enforced abstinence and you're staying away from the alcohol for a long enough period of time where it loses that attraction, your attraction for it diminishes the more, longer you're away from your cigarettes. What I'm saying right now is that over my last 30 years of practice, whereas I used to wean people and slowly change their diets to get healthier and healthier, that doesn't work as that well for most people. It works for most people to make a radical change at one at the at, even at the beginning. Mm. And, to, and to cut off their relationship with processed carbohydrates and fried foods and oils right away. No fried foods, no oils, no sugar, no honey, no maple syrup, no use dates and apricots and, and, and fresh fruit to free, make banana ice cream with bananas and vanilla bean and, and macadamia nuts and make Coke uh, bean, a, a chocolate bean brownie with some vanilla ice cream on top made of, you know, so these things aren't as sweet as conventional mm -hmm. desserts. Mm -hmm. But over time, your taste buds get stronger from the lack of the overstimulation, and you actually increase your ability to get the flavor from natural foods, and you gain back the taste muscle that you lost, and <laughs> you start enjoying natural foods more. So at this point, myself as representative of this whole nutritarian movement, these nutritarians, thousands of us, enjoy our healthy diet as much or more as somebody else eating their unhealthy diet. It yeah. just took time and work to achieve the retraining the taste buds and learning how to make the recipes. But there's no lessening of our pleasure from eating compared to a person destroying their health with food. It's just in that temporary period of a few months when you first start to flip over that your food maybe not taste as sweetened or as flavorful as your old food. But this is a, but that's, you know, but of course, you don't get something for nothing. You don't reverse your disease overnight. You don't reverse your taste preferences overnight. It takes some time to achieve that. 
but you're not going to achieve it if you have a, a foot in both worlds. If you keep dabbling on, on, with cocaine or you keep having the ice creams or the sweet drinks, the white bread, and don't forget, white bread is a sugar equivalent because white flour enters the bloodstream as glucose. And it enters the bloodstream with the same glycemic load as a cube of sugar does. Wow. So it's a sugar equivalent. It floods the body with glucose and it's cancer causing and it, and it ruins brain cells and it links to depression and dementia. So we're talking about bagels and pizza and burgers and French fries and sweets. And they add sugar to the French fry batter and they add you know, sugar to the hamburger meat batter and they add, you know, <laughs> they add salt to the soda just to make you more thirsty. They, you know, fast food is really, the, is, a, is drugged up food designed <laughs> to hook people. And it's not like you mentioned earlier that more people are in, starting to eat more vegetables, starting to eat healthier, understanding what a healthy, but, but you know, our populations, the waistline and the growth of people's weights have been continually increasing as a whole. So even though there's a, a narrow segment of our population that may have grown a little bit, the vast majority of people are actually getting worse, especially through this time of COVID. They've gained weight. We have more diabetic. We have more people overweight, more people obese, more children obese. More, and, and, and so we're really um, committing suicide with food and destroying yeah. it. And at the same time as we're committing suicide with food, in which people don't see, it destroys your brain, not just your body. Yeah. So you're no longer as kind. You become more narcissistic. The more you're a food addict, the more narcissistically and self-consumed you are and less interest you have in the outside world and doing better for mankind, your neighbors, your family, less ability to give and love and appreciate the world around you. When you're a drug addict, you can lie, you can steal, you can cheat for your drugs. You, be, you just want your drugs. And when you're a food yeah. addict, the, your food becomes the overwhelming, overwhelming you could say, governing your behavior, the overwhelming forces governing your behavior is you're just working to get your addiction, addictive needs met of the brain. Yeah. So people become dysthymic. The whole yeah. population becomes dysthymic, which means they're no longer passionate and excited about life, enjoying the world around them, being able to emote appropriately with other people and care for people fully because they just become just work to make money so they can so they can eat rich foods or drink alcohol or whatever drugs or addictions they're into to continue their their addictions govern their life and their life is not a fulfilled life yeah so the basic answer to your question is over the years i've kind of been more aggressively lobbying for people to make a radical change all at once, even if it's difficult at first, it, you get to that spot where you enjoy eating this way quicker and the possibility of change. My, my experience is the higher probability of a person maintaining this change for the rest of their life and enjoying it is people who make more of the radical change and don't baby step it, never get all the way into the right, um, into that right um, groove of eating right because they never start to love eating this way if they keep their one foot in both worlds. Yeah, I love that. That's what works for me best too. Like that's what I do. I go all in and even if like, I, I, I again, I love your analogies and metaphors like a taste muscle. So mm -hmm. I, but I tell myself, I don't even have to like the way it tastes. If it's good for me, I'll do it. But then eventually it tastes really good. And, you know, green smoothies, for instance, you know, we started, I started doing that like a long, long time ago. And at first it's like, oh, it's not as sweet. It doesn't taste as good. Now it's like, I would never want like a super sweet, you know, smoothie. Uh, you know, that, that really is what I do crave. The other thing that you, you said that was really valuable uh, for me and I hope for everybody else is you talked about like eating something and you're destroying brain cells. Like if you really do, you, if you really look at like a donut or something and, and you said, okay, do I want to destroy my brain cells today? We're all, you know, potentially not have, um, uh, you know, the ability to think and, and process as I get older, that donut is going to do that. Like, you know, most people would go right. If they're rational, they're like, no, nah, I don't think I want to do that. Donuts is interesting because I used to eat donuts when I was younger. I don't know if you ever did. You probably never did. But I used to eat donuts when I was younger. And, I, and a guy told me a story one time. And he said that uh, he was uh, hunting bear or something. I don't know. He lived in Wisconsin. I, I just met him. And he said they took a, a, a bag of, of old donuts and they put it in a, 
Uh, they wanted to, you know, attract bear and they put it in like a big plastic bag and they left it out and they came back a week later and he said it was just a pile of lard. And I'm like, I'm never eating a donut again. Like when I, when I just thought of it, like, oh, gross, like, why would I put that in my body? And so I love these analogies that you're you're bringing up because it's real. Like, listen to Dr. Joel, you eat if you make a choice to eat stuff you are committing a form of suicide. You even use that term, like you're killing part of your body. Like who wants to do that? You know, be alive, listen to what he's saying here. So let's get into some foods that are good to eat and, and, and that we can develop a taste for, Joel. Like what are, what are foods that you recommend? Because this is confusing too. A lot of people here, you know, eat this, don't eat that. And then someone else will say, no, that's wrong. You know, eat this and don't eat that. Like you've researched it and you've got proven results with patient after patient. What, how should we start eating? Well, thank you for that. Well, yes, the, you know, there are foods that, there are a lot of natural plants that are, that prevent disease, but the foods with the most scientific support for extending human lifespan and preventing cancer. I use that acronym GBOMBS, G-B-O-M-B-S, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Hmm. And we could just talk about that. Greens, yeah. we're a green vegetable dependent animal. And the nutrients found in green vegetables aren't optional. They're absolutely essential for most body, natural body processes and immune system function. Even, you know how people are told when they're, when women are aware that when they're pregnant, they should take a pill called folic acid to prevent mm -hmm. neural tube defects. Yeah. Well, is there something wrong with the human species that we have <laughs> to take a synthetic pill made from petroleum to prevent neural tube defects? <laughs> people can't even think logically. The whole health authorities and medical profession have screwed up our society so wrong because look, we're a folate dependent animal because we're a green vegetable dependent animal. And folate is not the same as folic acid made from petroleum. And folic acid is linked to increased consumption of folic acid through supplements is linked to increased risk of cancers like breast and prostate cancer. Mm. We're supposed, the reason why the, the, the medical profession and health authorities recommend folic acid is because our population is not eating sufficient green vegetables to support normal, um, normal cellular development and normal, normalcy in having a baby. You have an abnormal baby when you don't eat green vegetables. But instead of telling people eat green vegetables to get folate, they give them a pill to instead, which then increases that woman's risk of breast cancer and the child's risk of autoimmune conditions, infections, allergies, and later life cancer, just to prevent birth defects instead of telling them to eat. And we've exploded, we've created an explosion of childhood cancers because the leading cause of death in children other than accidents is acute blastocytic leukemia. And also brain tumors and leukemia are linked to the lack of green vegetables in the mother's diet, even prior to conception, not wow. just during pregnancy. And wow. the consumption of luncheon meats and fast foods linked to autism and childhood defects. So what we're saying is we have the science. And so I went on a, I got off on a tangent because I'm so passionate about this, this subject yeah. and how people are getting the wrong messaging. But in any case, we're a green vegetable dependent animal. And a person should be having a, night, a big raw salad every day. In addition to that, they should have some walked and cooked green vegetables in addition to the raw salads they eat each day too. But then beans are linked to longer lifespan, powerful anti-cancer effects. And if we score carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of quality, beans have the most slowly digestible carbohydrates, the most protein actually, they're high protein foods too, and the most resistant starch which fuel the growth of healthy bacteria in the gut, which, which have dramatic anti-cancer effects. And then we have onions and mushrooms, which are incredibly powerful. Our cells even have ergothenine receptors on them for a substance predominantly found in mushrooms that supports the cell integrity and stabilizes the DNA against damage. We're, we've been designed to have these, to benefit from the properties in these foods that people don't eat. And then of course, berries, which protect the brain and have such protective effects against cancer, even shocking researchers. And lastly, seeds like flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, which are high in omega-3 fatty acids and high in lignans and other phytoestrogens that protect breast against breast and prostate cancer that actually shock the researchers. I remember one study, followed women who had breast cancer for 10 years 
And those that had just a little bit of lignin, a third of one milligram, had a 71% decreased risk of dying of breast cancer over that 10 year period compared wow. to women who didn't have lignin in the diet. And one teaspoon of ground flax has seven milligram of lignin in it. And this study only gave them a third of one milligram. Wow. That was the wrong dose. And they still reduced risk of cancer in cancer patients by 71%. You know yeah. what I mean? So we're, we're talking about the tremendous power of nutrition and drugs don't have any ability to do what food can do. They're not even in the same ballpark. Yeah. And the first thing you learn in medical school is that drugs are toxic and they work by blocking or interfering or poisoning body functions and that they in cumulatively increase risk of cancer. Wow. You don't get something for nothing. Blood pressure medications right. increase risk of cancer. Antibiotics increase risk of cancer. We do all the, we, to the more drugs we're taking, the more things we do to our body. We, and the more, you know, you can't get something for nothing. You can't, you, you have to earn good health. You yeah. can't buy it in a bottle. I love and that. So, yeah. yeah, earn it. I love that. Yeah, your metaphors are so good. Like they make sense in real life to people. You have to earn good health. You can't just get it for free, right? I right. love that. Um, what about nuts? You said seeds, but are nuts good for us also, like almonds and raw I'd nuts? Say, yes, I'd, I'd say that in the last decade, the two, if you were asking me what is the most impact on nutritional science changed the thinking of scientists, researchers across the world over the last 10 years, it was the fact that adding more nuts into people's diets extended human lifespan tremendously. Wow. and reduced risk of cardiovascular death by approximately 40%. And we have 17 different studies that corroborate that, showing about a 39 to 40% reduction in, in cardiac death from people utilizing nuts as their main source of fats. So we're saying here, one of the interesting features of a nutritarian diet is we're not making salad dressings with oil, we're making salad dressings by blending nuts and seeds into a dressing. I might use tomato sauce with almond butter, with oh. fig vinegar and roasted garlic, or I might be using an orange with toasted sesame seeds and cashews and blood orange vinegar, but we're mixing the, the whole sesame seeds and cashews in the dressing. We're not using the oil. We're not using walnut oil, we're using the walnuts, we're not using avocado. We're using the avo we're not using avocado oil, we're using the avocado, using mm -hmm. the whole food. Tremendous mm -hmm. benefits for longevity for both all cause mortality, cancer mortality, and of course, cardiovascular mortality. And the second most um, interesting and nuance about nutrition that we've seen the last decade with these large scale studies coming to fruition and giving us tremendous data is that as you increase animal protein in the diet, you see earlier deaths, earlier age deaths with more animal protein, it accelerates aging causes. But as you increase plant protein foods, it makes for longer lifespan. So we used to think that switching animal products to things like potatoes and rice and low, you know, high carb plant foods might extend life. But no, now we see that it's the beans and the greens and the nuts that have the higher protein rich plant foods that have more power to extend human lifespan. So great for bringing that up. I've mentioned seeds in my G-bombs because the power of seeds to have the anti-cancer effects, but nuts also have these powerful beneficial effects, maybe not as particularly targeted and as strong as flax seeds and chia seeds do, mm -hmm. but still tremendously beneficial effects. And what I'm saying here is that when we're making sauces, desserts and salad dressings we, and milks, we should be using nuts and seeds, not oils and yeah. of course dairy products. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you told me that uh, eating mushrooms each day actually uh, lowers your cancer risk too. Is that correct? Incredibly so. Yeah. So much so if there was ever a drug that could do what mushrooms could do, <laughs> they would be making, they would be charging 30,000 a month for that drug. It would be the best selling drug in the history of, 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 pharmaco of the pharmaceutical industry because mushrooms like example of a study where women were eating one, um, 10 grams of mushroom a day, that's the size of your thumb and their risk of breast cancer went down by 64% when they wow. were followed for more than followed over decades. And now yeah. we have these studies where we have like thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people in the study and they follow them for 20 years till people die. So we have more, you could say, high credence studies 
because they're looking at hard endpoints, not like a short endpoint, which a soft endpoint, which means we follow people for a year or two and they've lost some weight, their cholesterol went down, their diabetic parameters look better. Maybe they, whatever they did to their diet, but may, maybe help them temporarily. But if you follow them over 20 years, they don't live longer, they die younger from that diet. What we're, say, we're seeing studies that look at short endpoints are corro corroborated now with studies that go on for decades looking at hard endpoints like age of death, cause of death, and how long people are living, whether they got cancer or heart attack. And we're seeing that we're getting more data that's more substantial, more definitive, so we can give people more definitive advice. They're not left in this way of who to believe, who should I trust? And I got this diet telling me a carnivore diet and they have a paleo diet and Dr. Furman's telling me eat more greens and beans and onions and mushrooms. Who do I believe? Why don't I just, you know, and now what I'm saying is the, we have a, a, a new wave of evidence that has made the, this hard to refute at this point that we do have the ability to design a dietary portfolio to maximize human lifespan, prevent cancer and prevent heart attacks and strokes and dementia. So the vast majority of people can live a long, healthy life without the fear of these diseases that afflict all other Americans. Yeah, and you brought up something that's important because a lot of people now are uh, you know, into uh, on the paleo diet and there's a lot of press about that. And they, you know, they say, look, I've lost weight, but you, you can lose weight, but not be healthy inside, right? So what's going on with the paleo diet? Why is that not an ideal diet, even though a lot of people right now, the press is, you know, building it up and, and why is that not such a great diet? Right. And it's an important point to realize is we're talking about short-term studies looking at soft endpoints versus long-term studies looking at hard endpoints yeah. with larger numbers of people. You don't, the, the soft endpoint short studies and the short-term benefits give us some indication to generate a hypothesis that then has to be proven to see if the long-term studies corroborate the short-term studies. They both agree. When they both agree, then we have more, more okay. data to suggest something is good to recommend. So the paleo diet, just obviously cutting out refined carbohydrates and processed foods is a very important thing. But when you but when they're doing it, instead of substituting more vegetables and beans and fruit, they're substituting more meats. And as you increase the animal protein, we're a primate, like a, like a gorilla or a shrimp. We're a, a, an animal designed for getting more plant proteins, not to get more animal proteins, which are much more concentrated, which then create a flood of uh, amino acids in our bloodstream after a high protein meal, which then raises certain hormones like IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, which then promotes cellular replication as an adult, leading to the replication of cancer cells. So we're talking about a lot of factors, the bacteria that, that in the human gut that develop to, to, to grow when you eat more animal products, produce like trimethylamine oxide, TMAO, which is a pro-inflammatory substance that inflames the inner lining of the blood vessels and allows atherosclerosis to build up and stick on your blood vessel walls and start to grow more. We have all the biological reasons why diets higher in animal protein drive heart disease, cancer, and accelerate um, the aging of the human body. So what I'm saying is, it, do, it doesn't mean that people have to be 100% vegan, mm -hmm. but it does mean that animal products have to be restricted to lower amounts in the diet, that if you choose to use them, they should be more like a condiment as a flavoring, not as the main um, portion. And the paleo diets and the keto diets magnify the amount of the animal product serving to even larger portions and makes for a higher degree of animal protein. And the studies we have on those diets now that we've tracked people for 10 or 20 years show that the most early life death occurs in people who've magnified the portion sizes of animal products. Mm -hmm. And it's the paleo and the keto diets in particular that's been shown up in the last five years to have the most acceleration, the most acceleration of early life deaths. So you could say the most dangerous diet you could do to the higher probability of dying younger is to follow those diets with bigger and larger portions of your calories coming from animal products. Yeah. And Joel, what do you say to people? And I know you've got a great answer for this, but what do you say to people like, I need to, you know, I won't get enough protein if I go a more, you know, more the diet that you're talking about. Is that, I, I know it's not true, but why is it not true? Yeah, well, that's the problem is the animal proteins do draw, accelerate the rate which you're aging because they promote cellular replication and, and cellular growth. And we don't want to maximize growth. 
We want to be fit and strong and have good muscle and skeletal development, but we don't want to get to be an unnatural size, either on our waist or our body. We know the shortest lifespan of any profession in North America are linebackers on football teams to have the youngest lifespans because they've eaten themselves into largeness, to such largeness. Mm -hmm. and it's not So when you eat yourself to largeness, you're pay, making a pack with the devil because you're going to shorten your lifespan accordingly. It's great they're making millions of dollars, but they're not going to be around that long to spend it or to enjoy their lives in the later years. Yeah. I was just talking with a friend of mine of his, this morning, and I was saying, you know, you know, what good is all your money? If yeah. you're going to, because what people do, they end their career at age 65, but then they're overweight and sickly and they can't enjoy their lives. Whereas, you know, now I'm really, you know, especially now I'm now that I'm 68, I love to smogle ski and play tennis and hike mountains and surf and, and play. You, you, you want to be in great health as you're better off later in your life as you have more time and the financial uh, ability to not work as much or enjoy, get more, enjoy your life more. You know what? You have to be mentally and physically fit to enjoy it. Exactly. What good is their life if they, they yeah. uh, you know, I can't believe people destroy themselves and they destroy their lives. And then those are linked to depression and loss of cognitive function and brain shrinkage with aging that people don't realize is happening as their joints are aging and their osteopor their arthritis is getting worse and their backs are killing them and they're losing their ability to have any stamina or agility or strength or their concentration, but their brain is, is obviously um, deteriorating is just as a rapid pace. And they become, and there's a link between processed foods and commercial baked goods and depression in a dose dependent manner. And I'm saying that the, the risk goes up 50% for people who have even two servings a week. And most people are eating you know, 10, 15, 20 servings a week. We have gross dysthymia across most of the modern world, which means that people um, are somewhat, have a flattened affect. They're not excited about life. They're not happy. Yeah. And they're starting to feel ill and lose brain function and the ability to, to weigh evidence and think logically. And they just, and their, their lives become somewhat tragic. And it's so unfortunate. It's like whether we, and we're seeing deterioration of the natural world, whether we're destroying our, you know, the climate or the whatever we're, we're seeing that same, we lose the ability to see what's happening in the world around us and to weigh evidence and to be able in our mind to encompass enough information about various subjects because of our diets are destroying the, 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 the width and the breadth of the human mind is being weakened so they can't enjoy their lives as much. And so there's so much here that has to be, that we've seen we're heading in the wrong direction. And, and now we're seeing our population is accelerating the rate at which they've been becoming overweight, becoming diabetic. It's actually accelerated now. And we're gonna see so much needless tragedy around us. So obviously I am, um, you know, trying to do what I can here. And I see, you know, obviously you are too, but it, it's a message that really needs to be heard. Yeah, no, you're doing amazing work. What's the uh, what's the number one thing people can do to live a longer life? And I, so we talked about G-bombs, but I think you, you also talk a little bit about moderate calorie restriction. Is that correct? Yes, I, I say that um, the most proven methodology to slow aging and extend human lifespan is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence, which means with the full nutrients intact. And I'm also saying is when you eat enough micronutrient rich foods like vegetables and onions and mushrooms, then it naturally decreases your desire to overeat calories. So the, the moderate caloric restriction part naturally takes care of itself because you, you no longer are the calorie consuming monster that you had become when your body was nutritionally deficient. It's the nutritional deficiencies that lead to food cravings and the inability to control your appetite and the desire to continually overeat and emotionally overeat. So yeah, we wanna get people in a safe environment. We want them to abstain from these addictive triggers to break the, that illicit love affair they have with this <laughs> self-destructive behavior. You know, this Illicit love affair, yeah, I like that illicit love affair. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. But, the, but obviously here, that the, to answer your question directly, the one most critical thing they can do is change their lunch oh. and eat a healthy lunch. It's the most important meal of the day. And they should have a big salad, not in a six inch soup bowl, but a full nine inch serving bowl of salad vegetables with a healthy dressing, a bowl of vegetable bean soup with onions and mushrooms in it and some fresh fruit for dessert. And if the whole country just changed their lunch to a salad, vegetable bean soup and a fruit for dessert, we'd see dramatic 
reduction of all type, all causes of death. And that's when people could do that immediately. And, and, but we don't hear this. We only hear about taking drugs, getting, and what, what we, you know, and it's always some drug solution or some chemical solution. It's never how you, people could take care of themselves in a simple and effective manner. We could empty out a lot of hospitals if people just ate that way. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. And yeah, they could just amazing. change. Breakfast is easy. And people could have, you know, oatmeal and fruit and flax seeds and, and plant milk. And yeah. breakfast is simple. They're having a lunch and dinner could, you know, and whatever they did for dinner, they could, it, it, it'll fall into place if they just put their lunch, get their lunch right. My wife has done that forever. That, that's her lunch, a big, huge salad. And, yeah. and, you know, we tease her a little bit about it, but because she's so routine oriented, but that's what she's done. And, you know, so I started doing it and, and I'm a huge believer in that too. You know, hey, we, we teach people that here at the retreat because we want them to, you know, they get from repetition of the right actions, you practice the right things over and over again, and they're able to duplicate the, the structure of the, you know, the portfolio diet here we're talking about has a certain skeleton that they can go home and duplicate. And once they got the skeleton going, they just keep it going. It gets very easy. You learn different salad dressings. You learn yeah. different wok sauces. You learn yeah. different things to change things around a bit. But it's all the same skeleton that they can follow and make and be able to reproduce this easily at home. I love it. And and really, what you what you buy in this in the uh, I call it the supermarket, but you know what you buy in the grocery store uh, determines what you eat, right? So that's even the first part to say, all right, I used to buy that. Stop buying that. Because, you know, that's what I noticed way back when. If it was in the house, I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is here. I might as well eat it. You know, I'm talking about way, way back because I've been eating healthy yeah, right. for a long time. But you come in our house, there's there's pretty much nothing that's that's going to be bad for you, like in our pantry or in our refrigerator. And it just makes it easier. You're not tempted because we don't buy it. We don't bring it in the house. Yeah, that's right. You have to make your house a safe zone. Yeah, you, know, you can't have, have you got to get rid of the ashtrays and the cigarettes if you're going to quit cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. and I, people have to go and get a construction garbage bag and dump everything out, you know, and get out of it out of the house and then and, and use the, And, you know, we're obviously people need help and guidance, but with the right information, the right guidance, um, this is not radical, even though, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's doable. It's everybody else is radical. In yeah. comparison, we look radical. But it's not radical to, to not self to not to um, hurt yourself and to self destruct yourself and to harm yourself intentionally, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I love, you know, just that nutritional excellence. Like in life, everything I do, I want to be excellent or outstanding. And I don't want to be I don't want to do what everyone else does. I want to I want to be I want to have excellence. And I was, you know, hopefully by watching this, more people will strive for excellence in this area of their life. Everything you put in your body has to be consumed. Something, it has to be, you know, uh, processed. And, and so putting high quality things in your body, it's a breeze, right? The body's like, yes, load me up with more of that. That's really good. Other stuff the body takes in is like, no. And you feel it, you feel like, oh, my indigestion or headaches and things like that, but we ignore it. So That's hopefully- Every yeah, day ahead. counts. Every meal counts. Yeah. Every mouthful you chew has a biological effects. Yeah. And you create your body, you create who your future you is going to be by what you put in your mouth. You become what you ate. Yeah. You become the person you ate. You ate. So it's funny because you know, even children get it, but the brainwashed food addict adults don't get can't get it. They can't get it because they're so brainwashed by their addictions. And by the fact that whole society has made, gave them this the medical model, they see doctors and drugs are their answers to their medical problems, yeah. which don't even work. Yeah. And they think the, the medical problem is coming from outside and somehow attacking yeah. them when it's really the inside. All of our cells are built from what we consume. So we consume crap, then, you know, the, the, the body has to figure out how to build new, hopefully healthy cells, but they won't be out of that crap. What are some, what are some great uh, tools? So we have the book for eat for life that's available right now in Amazon bookstores. Uh, that's out right now. Correct. Sure. What other, how, what other tools, how can people access you? Uh, where can they go to find more uh, resources from you, Joel? Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, on my website, drfurman.com, we, you know, I answer people's questions and I give them more, obviously, more tools and the camaraderie and the support. Because a lot of times, that, as you can imagine, 
changing your diet is emotional and you know, how you eat is socially involved with your environment, your friends and your life and making this change, people need support and camaraderie and more help. And that's why I started giving, doing this when I first wrote the book Eat to Live in 2004. All these people read the book and said, well, this sounds so logical, but now I need some you know, more information. So I put together a website, people can get more information. And if they want to, obviously, recipes and you know, emergency diets and diets for different conditions that are some tweaking it for various conditions like can't, what people have to do if they have cancer, an early stage cancer or, or um, diabetes, the di you know, diabetes reversal. And obviously my mantra is, do not treat these diseases, get rid of them. Don't yeah. treat your diabetes, become non-diabetic. Don't yeah. treat or control your high blood pressure, get rid of your high blood pressure. Don't, you know, so all these things to get totally well and get off your medications, because if you want this degree of protection, you're really only protected if you're at a normal body weight. There's no such thing as an overweight, healthy person. That's just nonsense. You have to be a normal body weight, have normal exercise tolerance, have a normal blood pressure without medication, normal blood glucose without medication, normal cholesterol without medication. You have to, rep you have to be representative of excellent health because you earned it. It takes some time, but it's but watching people transform their body, even if they're 100 pounds overweight, every week they move in the right direction. And as they're moving in the right direction, they still may be 50 pounds overweight. But the fact that they're losing two pounds a week, their diabetes is gone, their blood pressure is normalized, the risk of having a heart attack or a cardiovascular event has diminished more than a thousand fold. And even the risk of cancer has dropped tremendously, even when they're still overweight because they're eating right and losing versus eating wrong and gaining. Wherever you are, the direction you're moving plays a tremendous role in the metabolites produced by the body, whether you're insulin resistant or not, whether you produce more pro-inflammatory cytokines or lipokines and increase risk of COVID. You can be overweight with 100 pounds to lose, but you can make yourself safer within even a month just because you're going to drop the, get rid of the inflammation and be losing weight steadily. You start to fix the biological pro-inflammatory substances that increase your risk of death from infection. So you don't have to just feel, well, it's going to take me two years to lose that weight. It's like, give up right now. I'm just going to check out. It's impossible for me to do it. But no, you could, even if it takes a year or two years to get there, but the fact that you're moving in the right, doing the right thing to get there, you're going to see, see benefits along the way, not only at the end point. Yeah, I love your passion. You are a shining ray of hope and, and just, uh, just such a gift to the world, Joel. Thank you so much. I know you've helped a lot of people and everyone watching this is going to benefit and, and hopefully take your advice, buy your book, go find other resources. But just all the great wisdom you've given so far in this interview is going to change some lives. So thank you so much, Joel, for being with us today. My pleasure. Terrific. Thanks for what you're doing, Tom. Have you joined the conversation yet? If so, thank you. We appreciate your comments. If not, what are you waiting for? We'd love to hear from you and learn how this empowering information is supporting you and your loved ones. See the comment section below and join the rest of the community in discussing what they're learning in this Global Energy Healing Summit. Okay, I'm super excited about our next guest. He was on our first summit and he was amazing and now he's back with us again. So I'm really thrilled to have Harry Massey here. Harry has a really interesting journey that you're gonna learn about of his own, where he was able to heal himself from an illness that was crippling and, and really robbed him of his energy. So the Global Energy Healing Summit is about all of you watching, recovering your energy. And this is an expert that will show you how to do it. In addition, he's also had some movies. Uh, one of his movies was called Choice Point, Align Your Purpose. And another movie was called The Living Matrix, The New Science of Healing, which is going to be what we're going to be discussing, the new science of healing, how we can use science to help us heal more efficiently, effectively, and a lot faster. So, Harry, welcome. Great to have you back. Thank you, Tom. You know, it's really, really great you're doing this um, round two, round two of the summit. It's so, it's so nice to see, you know, so we've been in the energy medicine field for a a while but it is so nice to see that you know this is the top it's actually the top summit in the doctors um yeah. actually, i can't remember the name of the thing yeah doctor <laughs> summits sorry the doctor yeah. summit exactly it, it, it's so nice to see that energy healing 
is really coming at the forefront now and it's actually the most it's actually what people are most interested about um, which is so so great to see but yeah 20 years ago that wouldn't have been the case right but now all of a sudden absolutely. people are becoming more aware it was not the case like no, <laughs> when, I, when i started off it was like in a room with like four four people turned up and um didn't know what i was talking about and uh, yeah. it's very different now well, because one of your companies you started literally 20 years ago, back in 2002. Yeah, yes. Now, bef before we get into that, talk about your journey, because I think this is really compelling. Like someone who's never had issues with energy or never had a chronic illness, it's hard for them to help somebody that is struggling through that. But you struggled through that. I mean, you were, you're a fit, healthy looking guy now, but there was a time in your life where that wasn't the case. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when I was a kid and at university, I absolutely loved climbing and I would spend my summer holidays going out to the Alps, like climbing 4,000 meter overhanging faces or um, on the coast of Dorset, I would go deep water soloing. And then, you know, <laughs> when, when the problem gets too hard, I would fall fall off into all of the waves crashing below. Hey, hold on for a second. You you would You would be climbing with no ropes and then if it fell, you fell, you fell way down. Yeah, well, you, it, it's, it sounds crazy, but it's relatively safe because you just fall into the ocean. <laughs> okay. As long as you fall straight. But, but yeah, not, nothing went wrong, actually. <laughs> but yeah. soloing on the ground, uh, that's, that's much more dangerous and much more serious. Cause, uh, yeah. Hit the ground. <laughs> um, yeah, and then anyway, when I, when I was 21, which was in my last year of university, I, I had a fever when I was going ice climbing. I fell, and this was off Ben Ben Nevis, and then I didn't get out of bed really for the next seven years. And seven years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, I had a I, I ended up with a slightly I say a slightly, I mean it was it was with a fractured spine, although honestly I didn't know it was fractured uh, for for a little bit later. I think it was another two years later to I was in hospital and they had, had an x-ray and they were like, well, you know, you, d you didn't have a problem from this, this accident, actually, it was a paragliding accident later, <laughs> but, but it looks like your, your spine, your spine was fractured and, and fused from before, um, which, oh. anyway, which was when yeah. I was coming before, but slight, slightly different, that's a slightly yeah. different story. Uh, but anyway, I, I ended up with this fever and you know, it ha happens that I had like glandular, glandular fever and I actually, I actually went back to university, but I was very, you know, I was getting increasingly, increasingly exhausted, and really, I mean, basically over the next over the next year or so, I just was able to spend like less and less time like studying or you know going out. Um, you know, the, the 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 end the end conclusion is is I ended up bedroom with totally and utterly bed bound, uh, chronic fatigue, mm. and. You know, honestly, it was like a, it was really like a dark cloud. Like if you've ever been that that exhausted, where where, where you can't move and um, you know you can actually barely even think. Like you you get a little thought, but your thoughts are really say they're really like these very dark clouds, and then you you can't remember what you're thinking. And um, you know, honestly, it was it was maybe it's a little bit like like hell hell on earth for a while. Yeah, sounds and, like it. And, you know, I would try all these different approaches. I mean, honestly, functional medicine wasn't a big thing in Britain, but uh, holistic medicine was, yeah. was there. And so I would try things like Gerson therapy, where you do like coffee enemas each day. With <laughs> but it took, it took far too much energy to do that. And then I got out of it. Yeah. I, I did the whole like um, fasting thing and actually that, with doing that, I dropped down. I um, dropped down so much weight that that's actually how I got really, really weak. And wow. uh, so that 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 was no good. And you know, you name it, I tried it. Whether it was like homeopathy, ozone, I no. IVs, etc. I, I basically tried it all, but for whatever reason, none of it was having an impact on me. And so after about, I think after about six years or so. I just thought to myself, well, why don't I study where energy comes from? You know, I don't have any energy. Well, <laughs> what's this energy thing? And yeah. that that really led us into, you know, what we now call 
bioenergetics, which is the study of energy in living systems. Yeah. And, you know, from that, I ended up meeting, meeting the leading researcher in the field who was actually in Australia. And he was, mm. he was, a, he was a previous professor at Melbourne University, um, set up the first ac acupuncture coll college over there. Wow. And then after, after that, he just did private research in, into what we now call the, some people call it the biofield or, you know, we call yeah. it the, uh, the body field. But yeah. he basically ended up basically mapping out, uh, he basically mapping out the, the energy and information of, of the human body field uh, wow. over, it was over like a 25 year period before I met him and then to 10 years with me. So it was some, <laughs> yeah, 35 year, 35 yeah. year period. And Anyway, we ended up we ended up meeting in Los Angeles, and I I basically became his research guinea pig. And <laughs> well, and even I remember you telling me the story like it, it was so hard for you to even to get over there because you had no energy, but you flew to Los Angeles to meet with him, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a you know one of those billion to one sort of things. I mean, I yeah. well, actually, I mean the full story. I was a patient with this doctor in, in England and well actually I couldn't afford the doctor so I was with one of his sub doctors and but the senior doctor was walking past while I was having an IV and then I just blurted out who's the most prominent energy medicine research in the world and then he looked at me sort of weirdly uh, but he gave me 20 minutes of his time oh. gave, gave me this fax number of the professor in Australia. So he, he happened to have done a research project with him a few years ago. And but now we know this was a long time ago. You said fax number, right? Where you had yeah, to yeah, fax yeah. him. Yeah. So I wrote, I wrote a fax and he <laughs> sent back this paper on quantum biology with a note at the top saying, I don't know why I'm sending you this. Like, wow. you know, very odd note wow. that that was Peter. And, yeah. you know, I read it and it didn't make any sense whatsoever <laughs> and um anyway but anyway we you know we became we became friends i called him up and it, it was another year and a half later till we actually met met in los angeles and yeah it was a ah. very big ordeal so it was the, it was yeah. the first plane journey and whatever it was i think six or seven years at, at that point and uh but to to tell you actually what happened so so he what we now call an infraceutical, which we can explain a bit more later, but it's basically the idea where you can imprint information of your healthy blueprint in, into a liquid. Yeah. And anyway, so he gave me the sort of these very early versions of infraceuticals. And we would just get these outrageous healing reactions. So, for instance, um, you know, I had like many of us, well, you know, we all have our not all of us, but anyway, <laughs> I had all my childhood vaccines, etc. Not yeah, yeah, controversial. And uh, anyway, we got a huge eruption boil that, that, that came out of the came out of our arm where uh, you know where we'd had the vaccine shot. Wow! And we had oh, what were some other things? Um, you know, we get all sorts of weird bod bodily excretions. Uh, or another interesting one because I'd had glandular fever. You know, I was basically what you could. I was basically viral soup. You know, my yeah, 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 yeah. It was. Yeah, yeah. It, was it wasn't working. There were all these resident viruses. You know, going haywire and inside us. Uh, so he he gave us something to correct that. And I I got a fever for um, it was around two and a half days, and then the fe fever went away. And that's basically he he turned on the body's immune system to wow to basically tackle those viruses that went. So, you know, when that happened, I really knew there was, well, actually, and, and that, you know, I really yeah. knew there was something very, you know, very significant going on with, with what he was doing. And, you know, long story short, he ended up emigrating from Australia. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm English, so, you know, we flew back to England mm -hmm. and we ended up building the this practitioner company called called Ness over in England for uh, actually for, for 10 years before a, he, well, he died 10 years in. And then when he died, I, I moved to the States, but yeah. uh, anyway, it was great. And we, we ended up creating what we now call a bioenergetic wellness system that's able to detect and correct your 
energy. In other words, we can scan all the different organ systems, meridians, mind body correlations, trauma, etc. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and from the infraceuticals, we're able to trigger a healing response back uh, directly in relation to the scan and, and what comes up. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. And I've experienced it too. It's so amazing in that like a, a voice scan. So literally you can be anywhere in the world and, and using the technology that Harry's company has developed, you just speak into a microphone on, you know, on, on an app, basically on, on the website, it records your voice and through that voice scan, there's information about your energy and your health. Like, can you, I know that's probably super detailed, like technologically, but how is that even possible through our voice? Our voice is putting out an energy or an imprint or what's going on with that? Well, we're, we're on an energy healing summit. Do you, do you want the deep technical truth? Not too deep, like, <laughs> but enough where, where, where the average person can understand it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the quickest version of it and the, the full details are in our book decoding human body field so you can read all yeah. the details but the short version is because in physics absolutely everything is in, is interconnected um and you know the idea of a hol of a hologram basically sure. reality reality is holographic and so it means the information the information that is contained within your whole body it, it's also contained within your voice and there, there's other examples of this so like in in iridology or sorry, yeah. iridology is like a win, you know a window into the body and, and sure and the, ta it. the tongue the aura all the yeah yeah um so the voice yeah the, vo the voice is another one and basically yeah. because absolutely everything is, is interconnected we're, we're we're able to get a, like a it's basically a probabilistic reading of of what's going on in your body yeah, that was so fascinating when I did that. And, and, and just, you know, anybody that's interested in checking this out, it's really cool because through a voice scan, like, a you know, less than a minute, right, you're talking and the, the software that Harry's developed can analyze exactly which organs, which bodily systems are out of whack. And then let's talk about infoceuticals because uh, the ones that I was sent, it was basically water that had been imprinted with energy or with a vibration. You can probably say it better than, than I can, but they were targeted for specific parts of my body that needed some support, that needed to shift the energy. And you had a cold or COVID last time, didn't you? Wait, no, the first time, yeah. And then I, the first time I, yeah, I, I took a COVID test. I didn't, I didn't test positive for COVID, but... I could have definitely had that. So you sent me, you were so kind. You sent me uh, some things that were helpful, whether it was COVID or not COVID. And then I did another scan and, and then there was other, uh, my bladder, you know, it was different things that needed some support. And then I got some more infoceuticals and it was great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically we, you know, we, we recorded the healthy blueprint of all these different tissues in the body. So, you can record the healthy blueprint of your liver or your kidney, et cetera. Um, and that information you can then imprint into a liquid. And when, when you take the liquid and I say it's, it's literally just mineral water, um, yeah. memory and water. And then when, when you take that, it'll, it'll trigger, trigger a healing response. So you go back towards that, that optimal blueprint. And, you know, before listeners are wondering, well, you know, is that, scientifically verified i've got well since we last spoke since we last spoke to you we've had uh, the, the university of california they've been researching this uh, well i say they've been researching this space but to give it some context we we were at a joe dispenser event last march yeah and we we were introduced to the to um pr professor hemel who is the he's the vice chair of the I can't remember actually the name of his department. I think it's with Anis, Anis, I can't pronounce it. Anesthesiology and car, uh, car, I think it's um, and cardiology department. Okay. At the University of California, and yeah. he he'd basically been you know do, doing some research on meditation with, with Joe Dispenza, and you know, I was I was telling him about the the and what they can yeah. do and like um, 
you know, just basically seeing it. Well, obviously I wanted him to do research on it. And anyway, I was really, really fortunate. And he, he, he agreed to do research. And so he put, he put four PhDs in, in the department on our, on basically on the pharmaceuticals. And actually it was totally astounding. And honestly, he was, you know, he, he was like, I would describe him as like skeptically open minded. Like he didn't <laughs> know, yeah. He didn't really know what was going to happen. He wasn't really expecting to see much, but but he's, but, you know, he's also he's also a curious person. Yeah. And uh, but and he, they at the time like everyone in the world was obsessed with COVID. I'm you know, I'm I'm not particularly obsessed with it, but anyway, they they were. So they he you know he asked if we had any pharmaceuticals that that could reduce the transmission of COVID into lung tissue. Uh, and oh. as as it happens, one of our uh, pharmaceuticals that affects um, like vi- viruses, um, way 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 back, P- Peter had made one that helped like g- generally cor- coronaviruses, and oh. so we just anyway, so we just used one of those pharmaceuticals. He basically had some lung tissue, and we fed it. You know, we fed it our um, basically our anti pharmaceutical. Yeah. They uh, they would then basically infect you know infect it with the lung tissue with corona and they they can measure the penetration level of uh, corona or, and you know whether the lungs reject it anyway and lo, lo and behold so compared to the control the, there was this very large reduction in infection rate more interestingly because like we we sent him some for AIDS as well oh. and. With with AIDS, actually, they they got a fifty percent reduction in in infection on on AIDS, which was pretty amazing. And then he did a bunch of other other experiments. You know, I wonder if we could risk putting slides. Yeah, up. yeah, if we can pop it up. Yeah. I know. So yeah, so this is amazing. Why yeah. while you're pulling this up, so uh, again, it's a liquid. I probably even have uh, some of the bottles still around. Yeah, I see them right over there, but. But literally, just by putting the the infaceutical, the liquid, the mineral water with the vibration energy into the petri dish, it reduced coronavirus transmission into lung tissue, and now you're saying even AIDS by fifty percent. That's really really cool. Oh, uh, I might I'll, I'll uh, share the screen because yeah, have to enable it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. And so one 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 of the other you know other questions is so there's there's this idea that you can store information in in water. Probably people listening uh, to this event may, may be familiar with that idea, but it but in normal Western science that it's it's not a particularly accepted yeah idea. So he he basically got a paramet pronounce this word properly an electron paramagnetic resonance machine so an epr machine and with with that they can basically tell you know very um very very subtle differences in a, in, a, in a substrate like water and so um with when we make our pharmaceuticals i mean we literally have a hundred thousand bottles delivered you know they all came from the same bat like but basically the water is is completely identical mm-hmm. and then we imprint them with 72 different uh different imprints and then we sent them off to um, University of California. Anyway, lo and behold, I wish I, I wish I could show you, but I, we can't yeah. get the share screen to work. But anyway, they all basically have slight, slightly different electron paramagnetic resonance signatures, showing how basically the, the information is different. So yeah. that was pretty cool. And then the next um, type of you know experiments that they were um, looking at. And because because they're very very like all of us probably were very interested in longevity and you know li- living longer, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they they had they they had a whole bunch of stem stem cells in the lab, so they wanted to see if any of our biosignatures would would increase st- stem cell production. And it ha- happens to be one that's called maybe the name doesn't matter, but it's called carbon or oxygen hy- hydrogen matrix. It's just one of our weird words. And uh, with that, they saw a forty-five percent increase in stem cell growth. Over okay, I want a bottle of that, please, Eric. Yeah, that. That. That's amazing. 
45 percent increase in in neural stem cell growth literally by just taking that 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 mineral water with that vibration you just talked about and putting it into the petri dish that is truly yep. amazing and talk about why um it, it, or let me ask you a question we're we're pretty much water right with the we're, well, we're more... it depends how you calculate it but we're you know we're 80 we're 82 percent by um the i think it's the by weight but 99 percent by number of molecules really okay i didn't even know that well it's because so... it's because the molecules are so are so small but yeah yeah and so well so we, we we're majority of us is of what we think we are it's not this solid thing it's water and our and the water within us is already programmed with whatever thoughts or vibrations what you're enabling people to do is just change those that that energy yeah. those vibrations well, the, the mechanism is pretty um well it's, it's super it's super interesting and important but you know when, when you're looking inside a, a cell yeah a cell is basically consists of gel like water or you know the uh, Pollock calls it EZ water, or other people call it structured water, but it's, it's all the same stuff. And within that, you know, you've got your centrosomes, your mitochondria, and your DNA and RNA. Mm -hmm. But mechanically, when DNA and RNA split to make a repair protein, I mean, I mean, basically, you know, basically your cell is sort of like a, it's basically like a protein manufacturing factory, and Without that, you wouldn't grow muscle. You wouldn't repair any of your organs. Um, you know, well, you wouldn't generate neurotransmitters, yeah. etc. Like, I mean, it's it's it, it basically these protons. Uh, sorry, you know, our, our DNA and RNA. Are, it's basically the machinery of life. And when you think about it or look at it, right next to DNA and RNA, what's there? Water, basically, <laughs> um, water, and it, it's basically structured water. And so mechanically inside the cell, it's actually water molecules that are actually causing the DNA and RNA to split apart, select, wow. select certain parts out of the library to create new proteins, you know, to, to repair yourself. Um, and then the other question, you're like, well, that's odd. Well, where's the energy comes from? Well, it, well it's actually from just ambient heat and, and infrared mm. lights. It's, it's really, well, it's basically in, infrared, which is heat, is supplying the energy and then you're left with the question, well, what's directing it? Well, that's, that's basically information and it's, it's information fields. And so, yeah, I mean, literally life would not work inside the cell yeah. without this idea that water can have a memory and that there's information fields working through water. And, you know, you can, yeah. um, it's, you know, it's an odd, it's an odd concept, but, for whatever for whatever reason you know biologists um biologists chemists etc we've all been studying all these molecules and chemicals and you know structures that are sitting inside water yeah but hardly anyone has researched the actual water and the mechanisms of you know basically the mechanisms of the medium and and and, and how that interacts and you know yeah. for energy medicine it's absolutely yeah. Well, it, it answers so much for, for, for energy medicine. Absolutely. And, and just the fact that water can be programmed with, with vibrations and energy and then can even uh, work with our genes to turn gene, bad genes off and turn, and turn good genes on and, and the whole um, genetic makeup, like it can influence that. That's really interesting. You talk about to be healthy, you've got to have more energy than you are consuming just to what is the way you say it? you say you have to have extra energy on top of whatever uh you need just to survive or and sometimes well, they, they basically you have to have more energy available than your current energy needs um, yeah so, i mean may, yeah maybe i'll back up from there so i mean re really in a way there's there's really there's three main ways to elicit healing and what if you like and, and restore your energy and but and they sort of in the, those three sort of sit in this two these two big buckets so what one is life is an overall energy exchange um and two 
we have this operating system, you know, this, this informational operating system. And if you have correct information, you, basically energy is super efficient. That's the second, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the first because it's an important concept that, that, yeah. that, that life is an energy exchange. So, you know, we're, you know, we're breathing in oxygen source of energy. We breathe out carbon dioxide. We eat food, you excrete food, you go out and, sunlight like we we're just describing i mean heat is a very important source yeah. of energy and you know that like with, without those you know without that exchange of energy you know, life life basically wouldn't exist now when we're going inside the body there's also all of these energy exchanges you know between the blood and the cell and the mitochondria etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know life is just exchanging energy area but it's very and that really leads to this very basic principle for, for healing. You know, if you've got enough energy available in your body, you're exchanging enough energy with the environment. If you've got more available than you need for thinking, eating, you know, walking, whatever, whatever you do, your body will put that excess energy. It, it basically has excess energy that, that it can heal and restore and rejuvenate yeah. you. And the classic thing, you know, why people generally go down, you know, or can go downwards in, in health is because the, the, op the opposite is true. Like, you know, they're, pu they're pushing too hard, they're working, they're working too hard, they're exercising too hard or whatever it is. They're basically consuming more energy than really they have, you know, than yeah. really their reserves can, can, can handle. And so when they do that, well, there isn't any there isn't enough energy left to, to repair you. So you, you right. just worn down, worn down until, you know, in my case when I was 21, I ended up, I ended up bedroom because I was burning the candles so, so much in the yeah. few years before. And I, you know, no one teaches you that when you're at university, they just teach you to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, the, the other part that I like too, though, is that second thing you said, if you have an inefficient operating system, maybe you've got enough, you know, you're eating good, you're, you're sleeping well. Uh, I had chronic fatigue. I, mine didn't last as long, but back in 2015, I got a little virus and fever and I didn't get better right away. And I, I remember like, I was feeling like I was 95 years old, like I had no energy, like what you talked about. I, I was older than you when I got it, but I had no energy. I would sleep like 14 hours and wake up tired. And, and I think part of it was that inefficient operating system too. You know, there was not, because I was eating, I was eating well, I was trying, I mean, I didn't have much energy, but I was trying to get up and do some Qigong or things like that. But inside. It's self, yeah, it's a self-fulfilling cycle. So when, when, you're, when you don't have enough energy and you start degrading, as you're degrading, basically, your energy efficiency is becoming is becoming worse because you know your body hasn't been able to re repair itself. So your body's energy system or control yeah. system it just becomes super super inefficient, and your body is just burning up all this yeah. excess. Well, it's just I, I mean, I, an easy way of describing you know you know when you like oh like you heavily over exercise and your muscle is gets ridiculously tight and it you know it won't, yeah yeah. You can't really use it prop, you know. You can't use it properly, and then you have a deep tissue massage, and it all gets, it basically all gets released, and then it, it, your sure. muscle becomes efficient again. So it's that sort of idea, but it, it's also happening on a system, a systems level, and, a, and an organ level. Um, right. But it's why you know it's why like with our emphaceuticals or our new wearable that's coming out or our my health, you know, all all those all those particular you know, devices or therapies, they're all aimed at making your control system or your, I'll call it your energy control system more efficient because well, it's, maybe it's fairly obvious, but if you can make it really efficient, then instead of you, you know, needing this amount of energy yeah. to function, oh yeah, you only need that amount of energy. And if you only need that amount of energy, yeah, you can do all this stuff and you're not, you're not going to get tired and you've got enough to, you know, repair and rejuvenate while you're asleep, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's yeah. really, really, it's really, really key. Like you want to, 
manage your energy you, know, you want to manage your exchange of energy you want to manage when you're getting rest and, and recovery yeah. uh but the same the same time you want to make your energy system more uh, more efficient um so. yeah, that's an that's an amazing insight too though because even if people had the the same level of energy coming in right and they're using the same level if they become more efficient at the way they use it then then uh, you have an energy surplus. So really, that's an amazing insight. And I've never really thought of it that way. So that's very, very cool. Hey, I want to talk about some of the things you've got coming up. So obviously, with NES, uh, that's available to anybody right now. And it really is amazing. Literally, you do a, a voice imprint will tell you the health of your organs and, and even your emotional makeup. So really, really cool. How can people how can people access that? What's the best place for them to go to get more information or to to take advantage of that? I literally just go to the website, which is neshealth.com. Neshealth.com. And you know, you've got this free paths in that website. You know, you can be a um, a client of a practitioner and there's a practitioner locator, although obviously it all works remotely anyway. And or if you're a practitioner, you want to become a practitioner, that's a slightly different route. Uh, but you can also train up as a bioenergetic health coach. And so some of these principles that we've been talking about here, like life is an energy exchange yeah. system and the energy control system, like we we basically teach people in, in depth about about all of those concepts. So, you know, e- either they can use that not that knowledge on themselves or you know they can go out and basically co- coach other people in, in bioenergetics and help restore their energy. That's what I was saying, the same way you did. You learned it and now you're, you're, you're helping the world with it. So there's an opportunity for them to actually go through a coaching program, which not will, will help them for sure, but then also even be a, a business that they could do. And that's, that's oh, on that yeah, same exactly, site. Exactly. And it's a whole, I mean, it's basically a, well, it's a, you know, it's a cloud-based business. They, you you have you have the voice scan for the client, so and then you can interpret their their scan, and then we drop ship all the pharmaceuticals to your to your clients, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, yeah. In addition to the pharmaceuticals, yeah, generation of health coaching, basically, it's like, yeah. like, like with health with you know with health coaching, it's generally just about diet diet and exercise. Yeah. These days, maybe a little bit of mind stuff, um, mm-hmm. but but they don't they don't actually have the tools to necessarily help people but they, this, this basically gives gives the coach the tools because they, they can get an insight into what what's going on in people's body and then more importantly the actual solutions to get them better again yeah and the cool thing too is that that the the diagnostic tool they have with the voice imprint then you use the infoceuticals and then you have the the client do another voice imprint and see what's going on. Usually, you know, you see improvement, but maybe something else is popping up because there's always levels of, of of potential healing. The first level might pop up first, but then have, after that uh, resolves, there's new things you can help people with. So I think it's really cool that you're enabling people to learn how to be a coach on that with this great diagnostic tool. So they're not trying to just do it on their own knowledge. You have a quantifiable tool that will help them and, and help them in their own health, but help them help other people. That's really cool. Yeah, well, I mean, it's super important to us to get the, well, to get the education and information out of how, how all of this yeah. works. And obviously it helped, yeah. <laughs> and obviously knowledge is, knowledge is power in your own healing journey. Yeah, now talk about the wearable. I'm really intrigued by that. So you've got a device that's gonna be a wearable around the wrist. Uh, tell us about what it does. So I'm looking at it can detect, it can correct, and also protect, which sounds pretty interesting. So tell us about the wearable. Yeah. And that, that's not that's not out yet, but it'll be coming out late 2022. Oh, it's, it's coming out in in November. Yeah. Oh, November. Okay, great. November. Uh, so I want one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me too, actually. <laughs> um, they they. They, they see it well it's been called a gem which stands for guided energy management and to, to what you just said it detect corrects and protects your emotional energy and so i'll just start with detection so in traditional chinese medicine you can basically read 
29 different pulses. We've worked out some algorithms just using a PPG sensor that can classify those TCM pulses. And for us, for instance, you know, if someone has a um, like a like a, a slippery pulse, a slippery pulse in TCM medicine would uh, you know would would, would end. Which ones are slippery? Uh, don't get me caught out. No, I think slip, slippery and slippery is for spleen. Or okay. if someone has a, a, a worry pulse, that would be you know, indication of gall, gallbladder, uh, liver issues, or mm -hmm. a knotted pulse would be indicative of um, heart issues. But with with this wearable, we're not we're not doing organ analysis. So instead, we've translated it to to emotions and. So if someone is, someone's liver is off, they're generally frustrated. If their liver is healthy, they're quite they're decisive. Or with the heart, like the heart goes from impatience to joy, or the spleen is uh, an anxious, anxious, uh, yeah, sorry, it's anxious to faith. So mm -hmm. we made, we basically categorized all of these into different um, emotional states, and just to what we were just you know talking about when because we want to make your you know your energy your energy system more efficient no not that but basically because we want to make sure people have got enough energy each day one of the key areas that that happens with is, is through your emotions now if you're excessively you know angry impatient etc it burns up an awful awful lot of energy so yeah. uh, having a wearable that helps give you insight into actually when you're using up too much energy is, is super useful but what's more useful than that is correcting and protecting that energy and i'm going to jump to protection because we're talking about emotions one of the best ways to protect your emotional energy is through you know what what we call an an annotation which is an energetically imprinted meditation mm -hmm. and uh, because we know your emotional state we can personalize the meditation to help shift you out of that emotional state also while energetically imprinting you with the information uh, the, 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 it basically am, amplifies the effect of, of the mm -hmm. meditation uh, somewhat. So that that anyway, um, that's on the protect side. I'm going to jump back to correct. So just like the infraceuticals that we were talking about, we can in, imprint those biosignatures uh, basically using the wearable in, into your blood, and the blood is a little bit like in, in you know imprinting it into the water. So we're basically mm -hmm. imprinting it into the blood plasma and then your um, the blood flow then carries that information very cool to the rest very of cool the body. yeah that's amazing so so the wearable device kind of like a watch but it's a it's a, a device it literally can detect when emotionally you're out of balance and then it can correct by by sending a signal into the blood that helps correct that emotional imbalance and then also protect uh, now that would be from an app right the app that goes with it you would listen to a meditation yeah you listen to meditation but at the same time the wearable is imprinting you with a biosignature oh very cool and then and then, and then also you know we're going to be doing it in in groups so for instance you, you could upload you know you could upload your intention uh in into the app so other people could see it while a group meditation was happening go for a guy you know guided group meditation and at the end because you know the the thing that makes what the thing that I, there's a lot of things that make your intention more powerful and of being being in that parasympathetic state is one of them uh, but some of the other things honestly is the communication of yeah. what happened and the intention yeah. afterwards because the, the universe absolutely loves commitment so you know, if i got all of this insight during the meditation and the meditation we like are uh, we ask you certain questions so you can go into your past or current event and then mm -hmm. you, you know you can uh, we help you to reframe what happened or, um so that you then know how to have basically better you know better sorry but better patterns of thinking going to the future yeah. but it's super important to then communicate that back out to to a group because then you get some accountability and and you, and you also I say the universe loves com yeah. commitment. Yeah. If it's a bit flaky, wah wah in your in your head, and you don't actually 
you know, ver- you know yeah. vocally communicated out, you you could get away with not doing what you thought about in your head. Yeah. But if if you actually speak it out loud to, to other people in a in a group setting, it it makes it more yeah. powerful. So. Anyway, I mean, it's a whole concept we're yeah. developing out called, called an annotation, which mixes yeah. all those concepts. Is there a site people can go to, Harry, to sign up for more information? I know it's not out yet, but uh, is there... there's, there's en- energy for life.com and the four is the number four. Energy, E-N-E-R-G-Y, number four, and then life, L-I-F-E dot com. And they can sign up for alerts of when this is coming out and... I don't even know if there's a sign up thing, but um, there's, def- there's there's information about, about it out there. Okay, good. Get a um, sign up because I know lots of people want to know right when yeah, it comes if, out. If, if anyone opts in on nesshealth.com, 100% will be emailing. Getting know, the word out. Anyone yeah. in that database. So, yeah. Amazing tools. Nest, they're already available where you can literally see what's going on inside of you and emotionally just with a voice imprint. And you can become a coach for that, or you can b- become a client where, where you have someone coaching you and helping you. That's what I did. And then also the wearable coming out. Really, really cool. Harry, it's so great seeing you again. Thank you so much for being part of the summit again. And I know you got to catch a flight. Thanks for also working this in where we could talk to you today. And, and thank you again so much. Really appreciate you being here. No, thank you. It's great, Tom, as per usual. <laughs> So there you have it. This wraps up day one of the Global Energy Healing Summit. And I hope you've learned just as much as I have. Now, make sure you tune in tomorrow because we have another set of amazing speakers ready to share their expert insights and breakthroughs with you. And it's gonna be amazing. But if for any reason you feel you might miss any of these inspirational and potentially life-saving interviews during the summit, I do encourage you to secure your lifetime access to this summit by purchasing a VIP all access pass today. That way you won't miss anything and you can watch and listen to these interviews again and again at your own pace. Simply click the button below to order your VIP all access pass at a special limited time discount right now. And before we wrap up, please leave me your comments in the section below. I'm going to read them. Let me know what inspired you the most about today's interviews. Thank you once again for joining us for the Global Energy Healing Summit. Please remember to share this with your friends and family so we can all work together to make the world a healthier, happier place for everyone. I want to give a special shout out to NES for being one of our premier sponsors and then also Dr. William Pollock and Therasage for sponsoring this great event for all of us.